Hey everybody, it's James Lindsay. You're listening to the new Discourses podcast, and we got to talk about Gnosticism. So if you follow me on Twitter, you know I've been using that G word, Gnostic, a lot. You know if you are following the lectures that I've been doing that have been coming out of Arizona um, from the Sovereign Nations Mere Simulacrity conference we did at Redeemer Bible Church in early December that I tried to present a first foray into talking about kind of the woke phenomenon and others in terms of Gnosticism and another related uh, esoteric religion concept called Hermeticism. The title, uh, the kind of overarching title of those three talks is The Secret Religions of the West, which I think is how we have to understand what's been going on through the modern and postmodern eras. You may have seen me sparring some with Christians, I think, over the issue of whether things are Gnostic or not. If you follow me closely on Twitter, people haven't been particularly happy about that. Um, And there's a lot of difficulty here. Uh, I do think that woke, but also Marxism, and so woke being actually a derivative of Marxism, it's kind of redundant, uh, is a Gnostic phenomenon. In other words, I think it's an esoteric religion. I think when we look at the New Age theosophy, as it's called, behind Um, say, the Fetzer Institute and the creation of uh, social-emotional learning in CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social-Emotional Learning, which happened at the Fetzer Institute, and Fetzer being an open theosophist, an open devotee of Alice Bailey, an open devotee uh, of of Helena Blavatsky, that we're actually still working in the same vein of esoteric religion. And I think a lot of the things that have been happening in the West, arguably since the lead-up to the French Revolution, at least, uh, can be pinned on an explanation that's not really being given, which is that Gnosticism as an ancient esoteric religion and elements of Hermeticism as an ancient esoteric religion, which we could generally call esotericism and theosophy or lots of different words we could use, have been a running undercurrent in these developments um, through history And when you try to understand those outside of their own terms, you don't understand them. And there's some bizarre academic and philosophical resistance to looking at these concepts as if they are what they are, which is mystical, esoteric, cult, religion. Now, I've been hesitating to do podcasts on this very explicitly. I did one bullet kind of introducing the idea of Gnosticism in the modern and postmodern era. And that's really what this episode of the podcast is going to elaborate upon. And I've been hesitating because even given the Arizona lectures that I find this very difficult to communicate. I can't organize my thoughts. I've actually been quite despondent and in this weird stressful brain fog for a few months because I realize that I have to communicate this and I don't know how to communicate this. I had a very productive conversation with Charlie Kirk that, in my estimation, Charlie seemed to have been blown away by it, his um, facial expressions while we were recording it or something else. I think he spent a solid third of the uh, interview with his mouth hanging open, which was kind of interesting. Um, But I felt very disorganized. I felt very unprepared to talk about this in a concise and clear way. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of moving parts. One is the terms. There's these huge concepts out there, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, etc., and nobody knows what they are. Nobody's heard of them, or the people who have are, you know, kind of into New Age stuff. There's a lot of history. It's a very complicated subject. Um, The term Gnosticism means many things at once, which complicates things even more, and this explains why I ended up in a fight with these Christians on Twitter. Christians tend to use a very narrow definition of Gnosticism, but there are much broader definitions And I think it's important to realize that and to understand. The other thing is, is much like where I get criticized, and I've done a recent podcast on this, and I've done a number of podcasts on this in the past, where I said that Marxism transformed into cultural Marxism, and then into critical Marxism, and then into identity Marxism, and then into woke. Um, And that a key piece of that, especially as it moves now into the next step, which is going to be sustainability, is that um, the anti-corporate, the anti-business, the anti-bourgeois, actually, um, orientation of Marxism changed in the 1960s and 70s. Well, I think the same thing happened. I think what you had was in the Middle Ages, in the 
probably depending on where you were and who you were following under, you could make arguments for the 13th century following from a cult leader in Spain. You could make arguments from other times, but really primarily from if I get, I can't remember if it's 15th or 16th century, but 1500s or uh, 15th century, one or the other, there was the, I don't have to go look that up, that detail. I've mentioned this guy actually in the Hegel, in the Hegel podcast, a long iconic Hegel podcast I did a long time ago. Um, there's a guy, Marcillo Ficino, an Italian fella, and he was commissioned with translating into Latin the Corpus Hermeticum where it had been discovered. That's a kind of key religious text in the text in the hermetic esoteric religion. And this kind of between that and various other strains of, of mysticism and Gnosticism that were floating around in kind of middle the Middle Ages, especially as some, you know, strange manuscripts were being discovered and translated, led to what I would consider to be a Middle Age, New Age boom. We don't call it New Age. We think of that as you know, we could we could pin it on Blavatsky in 1875. We could give it to Jido Krish, Krishnamurti, who was kind of put up as a figurehead of this thing in the earlier part of the 20th century. We could give it to Alice Bailey with her weird Lucius trust and all this, and all of the kind of new age hippie stuff. We could blame Oprah uh, Winfrey. She really mainlined a lot of it. We could blame The Secret. We could blame a lot of things for new age. We think of new age as being kind of a hippie 19... 19- 60s, but maybe early 20th century, goofball, progressive, fraudster sort of um, phenomenon. But there was a new age movement, if you will, in the Middle Ages as well, where all of these kind of esoteric religions, especially within kind of the who's who circles, the rich and the, the famous and the important, kind of just blossomed and flowered. And the thing is about these esoteric religions is they are inherently syncretistic. Now that's a fancy word. What does it mean? Cafeteria Christianity. You ever heard of that? Where you take this and you take that and you mix it together and you make up your own religion, basically based off of a bunch of pieces that sound pretty good. That's syncretism. You take this piece from Catholicism. Oh, I really like the ritual. I really like the cracker. I really like the transubstantiation thing, but I don't like the way that we're going to do this, that, and the other thing with the other sacraments. So I'm going to take this from Bapt, from the Baptist faith. I'm going to take this from that. And I'm going to create my own kind of cobbled together Christianity. They call it cafeteria Christianity. I'm going to take this part of the Bible, but not that part of the Bible. I'm going to, whatever. That's syncretism, sort of. And so syncretism is the idea that, you know, they have an overarching idea of kind of what spiritual but not religious would have meant at the time, which is really mystical, but not religious is what it should mean. And they just kind of picked and chose from things that they needed. So if they needed, say, to bring in Jewish Kabbalah or Kabbalah, I always say it wrong. If they wanted to bring in Jewish Kabbalah, they did. And they made Christian elements of it. They made a Christian Kabbalah. And, and, and they, they took so Jewish mysticism, which doesn't even have to necessarily be mystical. It can mean something else underneath. They take this and they imbue it with tons of mystical stuff. And then they create kind of this weird cobbled together thing. Well, if they need the Christian Trinity like Hegel did, they take it and they turn it into a pro- dialectical process oriented Trinity where father gives rise to son, son gives rise to spirit and spirit reinforms and invigorates the father. And so rather than three um, pieces of the Godhead that are co-eternal and just are in their own being and essence, you now have a process driven Trinity. So you take concepts from Christianity and just hammer them together. Or let's say that you do this if you're Hegel and you hammer these things together and create something that he calls a system der Wissenschaft, which means system of science. So you just hammer it together into science. But why science? Because of course that's what Plato called it all that time ago. He called his his model scientia. Uh, his model of understanding the world, scientia. So science actually diverged and became productive when it diverged from its kind of mystical technocratic roots with Plato and has come back around now to what we call the science, which is directly going back to its mystical technocratic roots, um, where there is the higher level understanding of uh, 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 conceptualization of how things are supposed to be that Plato called dianoia, and the Hegel called Vernunft, which he translates as reason, or people translate as reason. But then underneath it, there's a lower level of understanding. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong. Plato used episteme for the higher one, and that's what um, Dianoia was the lower level one. I got those backwards for a second there. So Plato uses episteme 
Hegel calls the he puts it in, in, in he puts it in German to hide the fact that he's just ripping it off. Calls it Vernunft, gets translated as reason. But then on the other hand, you have this lower level understanding, which is dianoia, which is the understanding of it's like technical knowledge. It's what informs the techni of the technocracy, and so uh, so it informs its technical knowledge. And, and Hegel called that for stand for which just means understanding in the German. And so you just have this importation. And so the thing that Hegel calls his System der Wissenschaft is in fact or just a Germanization in the 1800s, early 1800s, of Plato's Scientia. So, of course, it's a system of science. But it, what happens when you do that in the beginning of the Enlightenment? You cobble it into that. And so what I want to talk about, and I know I've rambled for about 10 minutes to kind of warm this up, is I want to talk about Gnosticism and Hermeticism, but mostly Gnosticism in a very broad definition. And the first thing I need to do is clarify that it has meant many things and many times, and Another thing I need to do is make it very clear that it has a distinct presentation in the modern era that is dis very different than what it was in the pre-modern era. It doesn't try to pretend to be mystical religion after Hegel. Up to Hegel, arguably Rousseau a little bit, it's pretending to be mystical religion. After Rousseau and Hegel, it's not pretending to be mystical religion anymore. Gnosticism takes on the clo the clothing of whatever era and time and circumstance it's in. That's why there are Christian Gnostic cults that the Christians focus on and thus have a very narrow definition of Gnosticism. And there was a kind of a Gnostic phenomenon of mysticism that was happening before that and around that, maybe as far back as the 7th century BC. And that has its own mythology, that mythology sometimes seems to borrow from Genesis and flip it upside down, and sometimes it's kind of on its own. It's got all kinds of pieces that were added and, and separate. And it's a lot to try to unpack and discuss, and especially because it's a lot not important for the fact that the way that it got retooled in the early modern era, at the beginning, when the Enlightenment has finally struck its blow against, um, well, we could say irrationality, we could say mysticism, we could say even faith. When the, when the Enlightenment struck its blow against those, um, faith scrambled in its way, but also what I call now the romantic reaction, mysticism scrambled in another way. And I pin Rousseau and Hegel as kind of the figureheads of this so-called romantic reaction. Not a lot of people consider Hegel to be a very romantic figure. But I think he's continuous in this tradition. And Marx, of course, lands in this tradition as well. So it's a lot to unpack. There's a lot of terminology to unpack. Um, I find it very difficult to unpack. And what I want to do is kind of unpack these things conceptually without getting lost in the weeds of the ancient stuff and all the complicated definitions and stories. So I'm not going to go through the creation myth. I have a great book on it. Um which is called Gnosis and Hermeticism uh, from Antiquity to Modern Times or something close to that. I always have to look the title of that book up. I, I only have it digitally, so I can't look at a copy of it. Um, that really, in the first chapter, just really clears these things up about what Gnosticism is, what Hermeticism is, and how they're related and not related. Um, so I finally had a conversation today, and I find that I can explain it in dialogue better than I can explain it just to explain it. And so a podcast is me just explaining it, and it's very hard. In dialogue, people react. They have questions. They prompt me to explain certain things or pieces they don't get. I've been reading about it now for a while, a year or so, with bits and pieces a little earlier than that. And so it's kind of disorganized and in the water for me in a way. But... Um, I had a dialogue earlier today with with a friend of mine. If you don't pay attention to or follow him, his name's Paul Rossi. Um, he's a former educator in a private school in New York City who had the courage to speak out um, and and actually capture some pretty nasty woke abuses in his very fa fancy elite private school he taught at, which they relieved him of his duties for that. Um, you should pay attention to Paul. Paul knows what's going on in a lot of ways. So I'm talking to him and trying to explain it. And somehow we're just talking about something to do with private schools, actually, and schooling. And the next thing you know, we're talking about Gnosticism. And he expresses that he's not clear on what's going on. And I go off. Not on him, but into kind of a, 
attempt to explain. And I'm just going to kind of track some of that conversation into this podcast, but I'm also going to draw off of um, a kind of authoritative scholarly source, uh, which is called Science, Politics, and Gnosticism by Eric Fogelin. Um, that's spelled V-O-E-G-E-L-I-N. And I don't know if I'm saying the German correctly. I've been corrected like eight times, and I don't know what's true anymore um, about German. But Eric Fogelin is this guy's name, I think. And he has a nice little piece where he's going to summarize some of what I'm saying. But what I have a... He somewhere... I don't have it directly in front of me. Um, I need to go find it again. He actually... It might be in this book further along... Fogelin actually characterizes Gnosticism in terms of, if I'm not mistaken, three distinct characteristics and tries to kind of create a taxonomy. There's another big attempt that was done in the 19th century by Christian Bauer, who was actually tracking Christian movements. His name has nothing to do with that. Um, and there's there's some, a very difficult book about that that I keep reading some of, and then I get bogged down and bored with it that's called the Gnostic return in modernity because uh, it's very kind of in the narrow Christian sense. But I encourage Christian listeners who are interested in this to read that book because he's making a very compelling case to the amount of it that I've read. And he has a very interesting, this is by, um, this is his first name, Cyrus, Cyril, I forget, something. O'Regan is the last name, O apostrophe, R-E-G-A-N. Um, so, this book has a uh, bold, bold attempt to try to nail down what's meant by Gnosticism and to show that various kind of Christian spin-off movements, Rosicrucianism probably, Swedenborgism, these kinds of things, maybe even the social gospel, uh, certainly dipping in and talking here and there about Marx, um, are, are, are have Gnostic elements in them. And I think it's kind of important for for Christian readers to hear that because it's kind of in that more narrow understanding, but I'm not sticking with that because what I told Paul, and this is where I'm going to begin, is that not, Gnostic as a word, whether we capitalize it as a proper noun, so Gnostic or Gnosticism, both of these, whether we capitalize it as a proper noun or not matters somewhat because in my opinion, after having worked with this now for some time, Gnostic refers to at least four distinct things simultaneously, which makes things very complicated to talk about it. When I say it means four different things simultaneously, I want to be very clear. I don't mean in some woke bullshit way where they intentionally put multiple meanings in a word so nobody knows what you're talking about and they can do activism. It's not the case. It's sort of this weird historical accident that um, various things have been labeled as kind of the one true Gnosticism throughout history. And so in my opinion, you usually will find people say that it means three things. And I think in my Arizona lectures, I said it means three things. I now think it means four things. <laughs> and it's very complicated to talk about. So I kind of did a little explanation of this. For, and I said, so the world, the word basically has been used historically to refer to four different concepts. They're interrelated and that's very important, but they're not the same. And we'll turn to Fogelin in a minute to kind of clarify a little around this. Um, in kind of lowercase uses, there are sort of two. Um, Gnostic refers to very explicitly relying upon Gnosis in order to understand the world. That's the simplest thing you can say about it. That there's this thing out there called Gnosis that's a special kind of knowledge. And that's your epistemological grounding is Gnosis. And so if you ground your epistemology in Gnosis, which is a special kind of knowledge, I'll elaborate in a moment, then you're Gnostic in a descriptive sense. This is sometimes called Gnosiological, which is spelled in a couple of ways. Sometimes Gnosio with an I-O, and sometimes Gnosio with an E-O. Um, Marxists, in particular Paulo Freire, uses this expression a lot. If you remember from my Paulo Freire podcast on the politics of education, I brought this up many times, that he refers to it as a Gnosiological attitude, woke I mean, consciousness, being conscientized, is a Gnosiological attitude. In other words, it's a Gnostic disposition. You now have special knowledge, special sight upon the world. It's a Gnostic disposition. Okay, and so that's one lower case, is that you're just relying on Gnosis. And I'm going to come back to that in a second, because there's a second lowercase non-proper noun use of the word Gnostic, which um, is, is that disposition. It's a, it's a particular disposition to the world 
that is in line with what I'm talking about, but it's more specific. Um, it will be confusing for me to go too much into this, uh, but it boils down to basically thinking that the world is, is a prison, that life is a prison that you've been thrown into and that you can become enlightened to this fact and therefore have some means of understanding it so that at least on the spiritual level you can escape it. Um, so w when I say that Gnostic as a descriptive term, not as a proper noun, means um, that you rely on a special kind of knowledge. Or so it's, it's, it's special revealed knowledge, actually. Usually that conveys some higher, ultimate, or hidden truth. So, okay, this is like secret special revelation. This is like Archangel Michael talked to me and told me, or I had a vision in my mind kind of thing. And that secret higher special knowledge is often construed as being spiritual in nature and necessary and important to man's salvation from whatever his circumstances are. So when we come back to that second meaning of Gnostic where it's a certain disposition, those circumstances are having been flung into a world you didn't ask to be flung into, thrown into conditions. And I'm using flung and thrown as interchangeable translations of the German word Gewurfenheit, thrownness, flungness, which is how Heidegger explained being. Okay, so I'm doing that very intentionally, but it's that you've been thrown into a life you didn't ask to be born into, to have to live into, into circumstances you didn't consent to, and you're not happy with that situation, that pessimistic negative disposition that you are trapped in circumstances beyond your control. So you can already see that it also has, it's not just having secret, hidden, spiritual knowledge about your salvation. That's one understanding that's going to be very important because that branches off into the hermetic approach. But then the second aspect that makes things more Gnostic than hermetic, I know this is confusing, is that you have this pessimistic disposition that you've been flung into a prison of existence that you have to escape from. And knowing that you are in the prison is at least the first piece of the secret, hidden, higher truth knowledge. I mean, if I seriously, if I look up the word, let me just type this in and see if it does it for me again. Define gnosis in, in the search engine. And so what do we get? Um, gnosis. This is from the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 5th edition is what it's giving us. Noun, intuitive apprehension of spiritual truths, an esoteric form of knowledge sought by the capital G Gnostics. So we're not talking about knowing. Okay, it's special. It's different. Even though gnosis is, it says over here from Wikipedia, the common Greek noun for knowledge, right? It's the common Greek word for knowing something, but that's not what it means. Intuitive apprehension of spiritual truths, an esoteric form of knowledge sought by the capital G Gnostics. Definition two, science. That's that Plato thing I was just talking about. Knowledge, knowledge of the highest kind, specifically mystical knowledge. See also, capital G, Gnostic. Three, the deeper wisdom, knowledge of spiritual truth, such as was claimed by the capital G, Gnostics. Okay, below that we have Merriam-Webster. Esoteric knowledge of spiritual truth held by the ancient capital G, Gnostics, to be essential to salvation. These are the kinds of things. This is not just knowing stuff. What do we have here? Dictionary.com. Supposedly revealed knowledge of various spiritual truths, especially that said to have been possessed by ancient Gnostics. Okay? So it's a different kind of thing. Gnosis, Wikipedia. Gnosis is a transcendental as well as mature understanding. So there's your, your uh, episteme over dianoia, your vernunft over first on, your critical theory of two-dimensional thought over traditional theory of one-dimensional thought, if you follow me with the critical Marxists and Marcuse. It is transcendental as well as mature understanding. It indicates direct spiritual experiential knowledge and intuitive knowledge, mystic rather than that from rational or reasoned thinking. Okay, so... What I'm saying is Gnostic means anything relying on this, Gnosis. But there's a narrower definition of Gnostic that is, I think, important 
because it ties to what people typically mean as Gnosticism, but it's not as narrow as the Christian narrow definition with a capital G it just we just heard about. Remember it said, such as was sought by the Gnostics with a capital G? That means there were one group of people looking for that, which means there are more ways to do that. And that is this pessimistic, incarcerated view of the world, of, of existence and being, this miserable, you're in a prison by existing at all, and you didn't ask for it, and so you deserve to be set free. And if you could know that, you could do it. There's a, that's a second, deeper meaning. So this is very complicated because there's, we're already at two meanings. We haven't even got to the specific ones. When we get to the uppercase, capital G Gnostics, there are at least two meanings there, which is going to give us our total of four. There is actually, and may, like I said, date back as far as the 7th century. Um, it may have been a mystical ripoff of things from Genesis. It definitely drew off its syncretistics, who definitely drew off of the Babylonian and Egyptian religions. A kind of spin-off sect seems to be the Hermetic thing, which is actually fundamentally in disposition completely different. It would meet the first of those two Gnostic descriptive terms, but not the second one. This is very, I don't know how to communicate this to people. It's complicated. But there was an ancient mystery religion called Gnosticism. It has its own creation myth. Sometimes it's a spinoff of Genesis where it casts God in Genesis or Yahweh as a demon. And that the serpent, when whispering to Eve, is telling the truth that the garden was created as a prison to trap Adam and Eve and keep them subject to this higher spiritual being pretending to be God, who is actually what they call the Demiurge, um, which comes from the Greek word Demiurgos, which means artisan or builder. So in the Gnostic mindset, they are the builder of the prison of existence. But anyway, there's this ancient mystery religion called Gnosticism. It has its own weird creation myth. I'm not going to get into that right now. Actually, I struggle to remember all the, de the details. It has these things like archons and eons and all of these crazy things. And if you don't have that, you're not kind of Gnostic formal. I don't care about Gnostic formal because I want to talk about it in the modern and postmodern eras where we live. And so... Um, I think it's a fundamentally, this isn't something they say about themselves, it, I think it's a fundamentally parasitic mindset that attaches to other things, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Judaism, whether it's Babylonian religion, whether it's whatever, because it believes that it has a secret higher truth, partly that we are trapped in this miserable world, and whatever your creation myth is, if you're in this religion or that religion, Christianity, Judaism, it doesn't matter, uh, Hindu, it doesn't matter. Which religion you're in literally doesn't matter. Your creation myth is a lie told to you by the powers that be, not just the human powers that be, but in fact, even if the scriptures are true by the power that is, is a lie that's obscuring from you the true deeper knowledge that you are ultimately a spiritual being who can be set free from your bondage, but only by first knowing that. And I would like to spell that knowing with a G, knowledge for gnosis. Um, and so I think it's fundamentally parasitic and it latches on to other traditions and says, yes, but we know it deeper than you do. We know that you know all of this, but that that is a big conspiracy and, and illusion to keep you trapped in your bad circumstances and to never truly set yourself free. So enjoy it, but you've missed the whole point. And so what it does is it takes whatever it has in front of it and thinks that it has higher authority because it knows the secret knowledge of it. It's a secret meaning of it. It reads Genesis and understands that, uh -huh, the tempting serpent is the one telling the truth. We have higher knowledge of what's really going on because we have this weird creation myth. Uh -huh, there is science, but there is the science that makes sure that we only put out correct science. That kind of thing. It thinks it knows your story better than you and it steals your story from you in that regard. Kind of like the serpent in Genesis. Now, that's three meanings. The fourth meaning is this happened in Christianity badly in a number of ways, kind of in a huge rash in the first and early second centuries. And many Christian Gnostic cults spun off. I'll get myself in trouble unless I stay kind of in very safe, safe territory. I am not a Christian historian or a church historian, 
but we can say with I can say with absolute authority and comfort that one of these, maybe the most famous of these, was called the Valentinian cult. It was put down by Irenaeus. Um, another is the Sethian cult. Another that gets a little not purely Gnostic is the Manichaean cult, which has very strange views about good and evil and the fundamental dualistic nature of the universe, that good and evil are in this kind of constant interchange and that good can be done by doing evil through the way that it's, it's a very strange um, thing based off of this guy called Manny. Again, I'm murky on those details. I'm not going to pretend to be good on them. I read the book. I'll read the book again at some point. This is all hard to keep straight. And that's not because none of this is the point. And if you get bogged down arguing about crap that happened in the first century in Christianity, when this syncretistic parasite latched on and created a bunch of spinoff cults, you're going to miss the boat of why it's relevant to our lives today. And you're never going to get there. But it turns out, unfortunately, of the four meanings of Gnostic that I presented, Christians tend to refer exclusively to these Christian, early Christian cults and some of the spin-offs that came up later, the Cathars being maybe one example that comes up a lot. Some people pin Origen, the, the early church, heretical church father, as being a Gnostic in this regard. Um, they refer to that as Gnosticism and not much else. And also, if it doesn't have those kind of strict mythological elements that came in with the mystery religion as it attached and, and borrowed and, and whatever to these things, that's Gnosticism, nothing else. I think it's much more important to understand Gnosticism as a disposition, which is the second lo- descriptive definition that I gave, to understand what's going on in the world today. I also think that it's very important to understand that Gnostic in its broadest definition, which is the first thing, relying on Gnosis, which I gave you some definitions of, is something also critical because the word still applies. Hermeticism as an ancient esoteric mystery religion and Gnosticism as an ancient esoteric mystery religion are completely incompatible. Not only are they different, not only are they distinct, they are not compatible. They have different creation myths. They have a different orientation toward reality, a different orientation to what it means to be alive. In the briefest expression, one is generally optimistic. That's hermeticism. One is definitely pessimistic. That's Gnosticism. They're not the same thing. And I get criticized a lot saying that I'm conflating them. I'm not conflating them. My opinion is that due to the syncretistic New Age movement in the Middle Ages culminating and getting codified by Hegel, they were dialectically synthesized for the modern and postmodern eras. It doesn't matter. The truth is, though, that Hermeticism as a separate tradition relies on Gnosis, which is that secret, hidden, revealed knowledge. But it does not possess the disposition that the universe and life is a prison. It gets a little more complicated, unfortunately, um, because um, it sort of does. (laughs) It sort of does. The... Um, hermetic view does think that we are, that the, the divine aspect of man, the spirit, the soul has been trapped inside of a mundane world. It just doesn't see it as incarcerated there. It sees it as an opportunity and a religious duty to transform the mundane back into the divine. Hermeticism is fundamentally alchemical. Gold is a divine metal. Lead is a mundane metal. The goal is of alchemy is to turn the mundane lead into the divine gold by setting free the divine seeds, the divine spark trapped within the mundane metal to get the divine metal to blossom and grow. So that's al- alchemically how lead is supposed to be transformed into gold. Or death, the dead thing mundane, worldly, fallen, garbage, trash. And what are you trying to do? Create the elixir of life that keeps the divine spark in the body forever. So you're going to try to claim eternal life through this elixir that's created through the alchemy. And this elixir is going to transform that which is mundane and should die, your body, into something that is divine and does not die. So it's in Hermeticism, the gnosis is that we are a spirit thing trapped in a living, th- in a mundane, earthly, worldly thing. But the project is to actually transform and set it free. That transform word we hear, 17 sustainable development goals to transform our world, right? From the United Nations Agenda 2030. That's 
a religious duty in Hermeticism, you don't have that Gnosticism at all, as in ancient mystery religion. There, the duty is to know and actually to start to deny the world and the body, to become usually increasingly ascetic, to withdraw from the world. Um, although Hermeticism also hates the body, but it loves the body, but it hates the body. But that's okay because it's dialectical in nature and opposites are okay to mix together. Gnosticism doesn't have this. The body's incarcerated. The goal is to know. The goal is to spiritually advance through your knowledge, to renounce the world, to renounce being in existence, and thus, usually upon death, to spiritually advance and escape the prison. And there we could go off on a whole tangent about Buddhism and samsara and the cycle of suffering and enlightenment and then the beautiful bodhisattvas who, who achieve this and decide to enter back into the wheel of suffering. We could get off on a whole thing, but we're not going to do that. But enlightenment there is there. Maybe, maybe the Malibu meditator can deal with that for us. I don't know. Sam Harris is... When I read Waking Up, I told him he should kill the Buddha, and I don't think he liked that. Um, but anyway, um, I digress. So what we're dealing with here is that it's all very complicated terminology, but there's a there are two fundamental things that you need to know about Gnosticism that we can build off of. And the first of those is that it it's it's something that that relies on gnosis, which is this special, secret, revealed, hidden, sacred knowledge. And then, which maybe you got by talking to your hairdryer, to quote Sam Harris again, uh, or secondly, that it is this fundamentally pessimistic and carceral uh, disposition toward the world, which is very miserable. And that's when you choose between those two definitions, you now have broken off from Hermeticism. Hermeticism is Gnostic in the first sense and not the second. So this, you can see how it's complicated. Then there's the specific religion that's based off of that incarceral disposition. And then there's the way that that religion retooled itself by being a parasite off of Christian religions and other traditions. And so those are four concrete different meanings of Gnostic. So a lot of people like to tell me on Twitter, for example, that I don't know the difference and I'm conflating these things. Boy, are they in for a surprise. I really do know what I'm talking about. So when... You have the gnosis, or you've been given a glimpse, or a taste, or an image, or all of a download of the divine mind, the nous in Greek. Uh, they usually pronounce it nous, but I think it's clearer if I actually overcook the vowels and call it nous, so we can hear what I'm saying. N o u s is how it's spelled in Greek. Uh, I know I'm mispronouncing it, but I think it makes it clearer, so I'm doing it on purpose, and I'm probably going to keep doing it. When you have that, you've been initiated. Okay, so that's. An initiation thing. So in a sense, this is, uh, if we go back to the Greek view of things, this is a pneumatic. Uh, it's not a philosophy. It's theosophy. It, it's a pneumatic approach. What does that mean? Pneuma, spirit, um, breath, or whatever. So what it actually means is that these are people who, the initiates are on a higher level than everybody else. Um, they are better than everybody else. Why? Because they have no gnosis and you don't. That's the most important thing to know about Gnosticism and why woke and the World Economic Forum with its sustainable and inclusive future and all this has to be understood in Gnostic terms because their technocracy is based off of the Gnosis that at the end of the day, what it boils down to is they know because they have the Gnosis, they have mind and you don't which in, say, the Corpus Hermeticum or also in Marx's Economic Philosophic Manuscripts means you're comparable to an animal in comparison to them, who is comparable to something closer to a god because they've eaten from the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Don't you understand? Okay, so I think that's a sufficiently complicated introduction. I'll add with this nose, mind, whatever... Um, that the word that they use for this in Marxism and then especially critical Marxism and then woke is consciousness. You have consciousness. It's not reason. It's not faith. It's consciousness that makes it so that you know that's your nociological disposition. That's meaning you have adopted the Gnostic or the Gnosis, the, the, the special revealed knowledge about how the world really works behind the curtain, if you will. Because the general Gnostic concept is that the created world is not real in some sense, but is some kind of an illusion that works like a prison to keep us miserable and suffering, into which we have been thrown 
or flung beyond our uh, consent. And so we're incarcerated in that. It's a very pessimistic view. Um, gnosis is knowing this. What you do with it splits very quickly. If you have that incarceral view, you're in Gnosticism kind of more formally with more characteristics. If you are very optimistic and transformative about it, you're hermetic. If you're both so that you're like a Marxist or a woke, you know this and you're incarcerated and you're angry and you're miserable about it to the 10th degree and willing to destroy everything to get out of it, but you're going to do so through transformative methods. In other words, you're being Gnostic in motivation and hermetic in, mo in, in methodology. And that's what I think Hegel and especially Marx were able to accomplish with their uh, so-called genius and so-called philosophy, which none of it's philosophy. It's all mysticism. It's all new age nonsense, middle ages, late middle ages, early modern era style. Um, the more complete version of Gnosis isn't just being aware of this state. It's actually seeing also how that knowledge paints a path to your salvation from that state. So the hermetic path is one of transformation. You transform the world and you no longer have to suffer. The Gnostic path is one of renunciation and destruction. You no longer have to suffer if you blow the prison up. But in essence, it's knowledge about how to affect something like the jailbreak from the prison of being. This is why when Jordan Peterson says that these people are angry at existence for the crime of being, he's actually hitting it exactly. These people are Gnostic. He's correct. So this illusion of the prison of being can take on lots of forms, depending on which thing it's cobbled onto or who's making it up at the moment. Because there are no rules. What's going to stop you from making up secret hidden knowledge? Nothing. What are you going to defer to? Reality? No. You're saying reality is an illusion, so you're not going to do that. Scripture? No. You have a secret higher, you know, Bible code understanding of it. You're not going to use rigorous exegesis or whatever to understand. So reason and faith are not going to stop you. You can make up anything you want. And so you have this story in um, the very traditionally in Gnosticism where Yahweh is the prison, uh, the, the prison warden and prison architect of Eden, and then when Adam try or Eve, I guess, eats from the fruit, and Adam eats of the fruit, and they, they commit the, the first sin, he kicks them out of the garden and throws them into the, to the real prison of suffering, of starvation, of pain, and childbirth, and all of these other things that Genesis um, chapters 3 and 4 describe, and as punishment for disobedience. The Gnostic view of that is basically God in Genesis is a slightly higher level being than you. He's the same thing as you as a man, but he's already eaten from the fruit of the tree of knowledge and the fruit of the tree of life. And so he's more godly, godlike, not godly. He's definitely not godly because there's a real God out there. He's more godlike than you. And what does he say? Well, they'll become like us. And so that's where they say, oh, well, this is an indication that actually that's our true state of being. We have the gnosis. And therefore, that's what we should be able to do. And that's why Herbert Marcuse in, say, 1955, when he writes in um, Eros and Civilization that the way back into the garden is to take a second bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, um, he's saying that gnosis is the path back to our true birthright, which is not just to be in the garden, but to be as gods in the garden. But unfortunately, because of the state of the circumstances, we have to rebuild that because of the illusory world that we live in. So the entire existence can be an illusion, a prison created by an evil demiurge, demon character that we call Yahweh, that poses as God to us so we mistakenly worship it and miss the true all behind the all, the, the undifferentiated, perfected God that is actually the real God, and because and, and he keeps us trapped in our prison. So it can be that kind of an illusion. There's this other thing that I have to talk about at some point. It's called A Course in Miracles. It's totally batshit. I haven't read it. It's almost 1,300 pages long of just kind of psychotic rambling. I read a very important synopsis of it on the Fetzer Institute Spiritual Library. Now, why does the Fetzer Institute matter? John Fetzer, we did this whole podcast, WTF is SEO. Social emotional learning emerged from the Fetzer Institute. The Fetzer Institute was created by John Fetzer. Fetzer was into all this weird New Age theosophy stuff. He was into Hermetic stuff. He was into Gnostic stuff. He was into 
uh, Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey with their theosophical movement stuff. But it turns out he thought that A Course in Miracles, which is a properly insane book um, to the degree that I understand it. Like I said, I read this like 30 page synopsis of it and its relevance to John Fetzer. It was so important to him that he underlined in his own personal copy, virtually every sentence in it. He said it was the most profound spiritual work that he thinks had ever been written. And in the foundation of the Fetzer Institute in Kalamazoo, Michigan is a copy of A Course in Miracles because he wanted his entire program, his entire institute and all that it does to be built on the foundation of A Course in Miracles. Well, in that book, it tells us that Adam, in fact, in the garden, when he ate the fruit, remember we're talking about gnosis and Gnosticism and believing that the world is an illusion of some kind. It turns out that the fruit in the in the garden, the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was in fact a poisonous psychedelic drug. And in fact, Adam went I mean, this was written like during MK Ultra time or whatever, LSD land. So here you go. So Adam actually is tripping balls. And in his tripping balls, fever dream is the universe we live in. And we are trapped in his fever dream. But the gnosis in A Course in Miracles that allows you to do the thing called the secret that people like Oprah pushed, the gnosis is... Adam never actually did anything wrong. There was no sin. It's all an illusion. It's all this weird dream. It's all this weird drug-induced dream. Nothing actually, no disobedience ever happened. And so if there was no original sin, then nobody's sinning. There is no sin. We're already in our state of perfection, which is really scary because everything evil becomes okay and justified under the fact that you think that we're actually under a state of perfection and the evil is only an illusion in the world. So the illusion takes on different forms at different times. I would argue and will argue some more later that for Karl Marx, the bourgeoisie in control of the means of production of economic and material conditions, which in turn shape people and society, become the people who make the illusion. So that's why he says religion is just an aspect of the thing they create to keep you worshiping the false God so that you don't worship the true God, which is yourself. See, because... They are actually structuring your life. There's a doctrine called material determinism under Marxist thought that explains this. They rig the system to their own benefit that structures and conditions your life. And as such, you adopt a consciousness of that that's not an awakened or class consciousness of what's really going on. And they, therefore, are acting as that demiurge in creating a world of illusions called ideology that contours why you believe the world is the way that it is. We see this in critical race theory with the construction of whiteness as a form of property that then gives rise to a ideology called white supremacy that contours the world into systemic racism that structurally and materially determines people and their lots based on racial category, which is all arbitrary and fake and socially constructed by the arbiters of whiteness as a form of property to keep themselves up and everybody else down. This is all Gnostic. You've just placed demiurgic power in sociological or economic phenomena, and that's what I think they've done. This is super, super important to understand if you want to understand these people. Um, let's see, where else do I have to go with this? Let's just turn before I carry on. I'm going to read to you a couple pages from Fogelein, Science, Politics, and Gnosticism, like I said. Um, this is an important book. This is from, I'm not going to read a lot of the book. I'm going to read about two and a half pages from the introduction, starting on page seven of the copy that I have. Um, this is of the profusion of Gnostic experiences. So the reason I want to explain this to you or read this to you is because um, it gives a very clear understanding of Gnosticism in a kind of very broad way after that kind of very convoluted explanation I'm trying to stumble through to help you understand. Um, let's see. I want to also add, by the way, that the Fogelein was a Christian. If I believe, if I believe, if I'm right, I believe he was a Catholic and that was his answer to all of this. I'm obviously not subscribed to that perspective, but it will kind of crop up in some of the things that he says. Um, and I am sympathetic to the way that he says some of the things that he says in that regard, but so let's see what he says. He says, of the profusion of Gnostic experiences. So that's what I've kind of been communicating to you. There is a profusion of them. Of the profusion of Gnostic experiences and symbolic expressions, one feature may be singled out as the central element in this varied and extensive creation of meaning. 
the experience of the world as an alien place into which man has strayed and from which he must find his way back home to the other world of his origin. Quote, Who has cast me into this suffering of this world? End quote. Asks the, quote, great life of the Gnostic texts, which is also the, quote, first alien life from the worlds of, li- worlds of light, end quote. It is an alien in this world, and this world is alien to it. Now, I'll point out how often Marx brings up the concept of alienation. It's central. It's strange self-estrangement through private property and uh, through uh, the division of labor. You're alienated from your life. You're alienated from your work. You're alienated from one another. You're alienated from your true nature as a species being who lives for the species. Uh, In other words, a socialist or a communist. Uh, You're alienated from your true nature. He talks about God in his denunciations of religion as an alien being who's projected upon to us and that we worship this alien being. But then that's used to alienate us. So this concept is central to Marxist structure and thought. Uh, so going back to Fogelein, he says, quote, This world was not made according to the desire of the life, not by the will of the great life art thou come hither. End quote. And he's quoting, it says, discussions of these and the following texts can be found in Hans Jonas, which I assume I'm saying right, maybe it's Jonas, J-O-N-A-S, uh, in the Gnostic religions. So there's a book by this character called The Gnostic Religion, which uh, is being quoted from here. Therefore the question, quote, who conveyed me into the evil darkness, and the entreaty, quote, deliver us from the darkness of this world into which we are flung, end quote. So that's the, what he's saying is that's the, that's the fundamental disposition of Gnosticism. When I said that there's that first definition that relies on Gnosis, not that, more. The Gnosis is that disposition, that thing that I said is the second descriptive definition of it. That's what he's saying is essential to something being Gnostic. So I, by including Hermeticism, am using a broader definition. We maybe need a better word. I don't know. Anyway, he goes on. He says, The world is no longer the well-ordered, the cosmos in which Hellenistic man felt at home, nor is it the Judeo-Christian world that God created and found good. Gnostic man no longer wishes to perceive in admiration the intrinsic order of the cosmos. For him, the world has become a prison from which he wants to escape. Quote, The wretched soul has strayed into a labyrinth of torment and wanders around without a way out. It seeks to escape from the bitter chaos, but knows not how to get out. End quote. Therefore, the confused, plaintive question asked of the great life, quote, Why didst thou create this world? Why didst thou order the tribes here from thy midst? Why did you make the world and why did you put us in it? That's what's being asked of the true great life, the God, behind everything else. In the Gnostic text here. From this attitude, notice I say it's an attitude or disposition as well, right? From this attitude springs the programmatic formula of Gnosticism, which Clement of Alexandria recorded, and I've seen this also um, credited to, uh, who is it? Um, Tacitus or something, somebody else, doesn't matter. Clement of Alexandria recorded, Gnosis is, quote, the knowledge of who we were and what we became, of where we were and whither into we have been flung, of where to we are hastening and where from we are redeemed, of what birth is and what rebirth, end quote. The great speculative myth Mythopoems of Gnosticism. So this is actually very central to mythopoetic thought, and that's why it's central to the romantic thing that I said earlier, and that's why I think that this other current that we're failing to understand, that gave birth to the progressive movement, that gave birth to Marxism, that gave birth to neoliberalism, that gave birth to all of these things, actually springs from the romantic reaction that kind of had its first big uh, heyday with the French Revolution. And that's why we keep seeing 
other revolutions look like the French Revolution because they're actually in this romantic reaction that wants to get back to a sensuous understanding of the world. Not so technical. Let's add intuition, sensuality, sincerity, sentimentality. Um, let's express things mythopoetically using mythological characters and poetic expression in order to understand the world. That's another kind of knowing. It's a romantic kind of knowing. And that's what I'm kind of tying in here and saying this is all in the big grand romantic reaction. But is there the great speculative myth of poems of Gnosticism revolve around the questions of origin, the condition of having been flung, escaped from the world, and the means of deliverance. So that's what I was saying is I think what boils down to the low levels, kind of one, two, three levels of Gnosticism doesn't rely on Gnosis, which is special hidden knowledge. That's definition one. A deeper understanding is that the world is a prison and an even deeper understanding is, or that you've been flung into, and a deeper, deeper understanding is how, do, how can you use that knowledge to get out of it? In the quoted text, the reader will have recognized Hegel's alienated spirit and Heidegger's flungness. Gave Orphanheit, told you, of human existence. I guess it's not fair that I told you because I actually read this thing. Um, this similarity in symbolic expression results from a homogeneity in experience of the world. And the homogeneity goes beyond the experience of the world to the image of man and the salvation with which both the modern and ancient Gnostics respond to the condition of, quote, thingness in alien world. In other words, what does it mean to be a thing? To be an object. You know, all that stuff in Marxism and Hegel about the object and the subject, objective versus subjective, and the dialectic between the object and the subject, and that man has to, in Marxism, realize that he is a subjective being operating in an objective world, and things that he objectively creates thus reflect back on his subjectivity and lead him to understand that he is a creator through his own subjectivity that can create that which is in the objective world, and thus the object and the, object and the subject are dialectically fused. Yeah, that's Gnosticism, baby. Thingness. Dealing with the concept of thingness in the world. Fogelin says, if a man is to be delivered from the world, the possibility of deliverance must first be established in the order of being. In the He's not a particularly easy writer, by the way. In the ontology of ancient Gnosticism, this is accomplished through faith in the, quote, alien, quote, hidden God, who comes to man's aid, sends him his messengers, and shows him the way out of the prison of the evil God of this world, be he Zeus or Yahweh or one of the other ancient father gods. In modern Gnosticism, this is important because that's what I'm actually trying to get to talk about in this podcast. In modern Gnosticism, it is accomplished through the assumption of an absolute spirit. So that's Hegel, by the way. And it's, I think, difficult because with Marx, it's different. Um, the assumption of an absolute spirit, which in the dialectical unfolding of consciousness, proceeds from alienation to consciousness of itself, or through the assumption of a dialectical material process of nature, which in its course leads from the alienation resulting from private property and belief in God to the freedom of a fully human existence, or through the assumption of a will of nature which transforms man into Superman. And so, of course, here we're dipping on Nietzsche, for example. Within the ontic possibility, however, Gnostic man must carry on the work of salvation himself. Now, through his psyche, or soul, he belongs to the order, the nomos, of the world. What impels him to, uh, toward deliverance is the pneuma, or spirit. So this is where I was saying it's a pneumatic disposition. And again, you see that actually in, in various writings about it. The labor of salvation, therefore, entails the dissolution of the worldly constitution of the psyche, and at the same time, the gathering and freeing of the powers of the pneuma. Again, that's spirit. However, the phases of salvation are represented in the different sects and systems, and they vary from magic practices to mystic ecstasies. From libertinism, so I guess that would be like Marquis de Sade, from libertinism through, the, uh, through indifferentism to the world to the strictest asceticism. Okay, so maybe you're going through orgiastic celebration and throwing off all restrictions and rules on yourself and libertinism. Maybe it's 
in differentism, that's what I would say is mostly the hermetic process. So libertinism would almost be the Eleusinian path, which is the orgiastic celebrations, the Dionysian religion uh, kind of things, drag queen story hour, basically, um, and whatever sexual liberation follows from that. Indifferentism, that's actually postmodern deconstruction in our kind of postmodern world, but it's the hermetic attempt to destroy all uh, distinctions. Distinctions in hermeticism are an illusion. That's what makes the mundane world mundane. We'll come back to that. To, uh, uh, to sorry, to um, mystic ecstasy, ecstasies. So this is going to be through kind of very uh, religious trance-like kind of well, religious ecstasies, maybe you're chanting, maybe whatever, so that you end up having these kind of, you know, experiences. Maybe it's LSD. Or sorry, I skipped, not mystic ecstasy, sorry, sorry. To the strictest asceticism. So that's you going off in the cave and, and meditating your way out of the world. Sometimes I read this thing, I saw this video, it was crazy. This is Japanese practice, these crazy Buddhist sect, and they would like literally drink all these like minerals and these various poisons and like resins and all this and they would meditate and what they're trying to do is literally mummify themselves while they're alive and then eventually they their their students they get in a meditative position in a box and their students box close the box and bury them in the box and then they come back like three years later and if the body decayed at all they didn't do it right but if the body didn't decay, then that meant they achieved immortality because they removed the element of decay from the body through um, alchemical transformation. That's I don't think you get stricter asceticism than that, but whatever. The aim is always destruction of the old world and passage into the new is the point that he's making. It doesn't matter what the path is. It doesn't matter if it's libertinism, indifferentism, or strictest asceticism. The point is always destruction of the old world and passage into the new. You know, just like how Mao Zedong wanted to destroy the four olds and bring us into a new world. Just like the Jacobins wanted to destroy the old order in France and usher in a new order with a new calendar that starts at year zero. Or maybe it was year one for them. They had a whole new calendar, a whole new everything. Ten-month calendar, all weird. That's why the thing that ends up coming back and killing a lot of the Jacobins is called the Thermidorian Reaction. Sounds like Game of Thrones or Dungeons and Dragons or Tolkien, but it's not. One of the fake months they made up was called Thermidor. So the Thermidorian reaction happened in the month of Thermidor, which is a made-up month where they made up the whole thing. Year zero was Pol Pot in Cambodia. We're going to reset the world to, to year zero. So what do we have going on today? The Great Reset to a sustainable and inclusive future. It is always the destruction of the old world and passage to the new. The instrument of salvation is Gnosis itself knowledge. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But it's in levels, just like how George Lukács and then Ferrari developed the idea that consciousness is educable and graduated. You know that you're in a class, then you know that what the role of being in a class is, and you know the class is created, then you know that you have a role in history to destroy class overall. For example, I go through that in detail in something like nine steps for Ferrari and like six or seven steps for Lukács in the Marxification of Education, which you should definitely read. Since according to the Gnostic ontology, entanglement with the world is brought about by agnoia, ignorance, the soul will be able to disentangle itself through knowledge of its true life and its condition of alienness in this world. So you understanding alienation allows you to disentangle yourself from the world. That's your gateway to gnosis, or as Marx puts it, suffering is your gateway to true knowledge. He says that in the Economic Philosophic Manuscript. So your true knowledge you arrive at through suffering, correctly guided through the Marxist cult initiation, is called socialism. That's the gnosis. That's understanding that we're a species being destined and meant to live in a communism. Right? And so in Gnosticism, I'll read that sentence again, Ontology, uh, sorry, Gnostic ontology entanglement with the world is brought about by agnoia, ignorance. The soul will be able to disentangle itself through knowledge of its true life and its condition of alienness in this world. So if they can alienate the hell out of you, like Marxism does intentionally, 
then you will be more conscious because you're being alienated. If they can alienate you from your society by telling you that it's racially contoured by structurally deterministic systemic racism, they can alienate you from yourself and your society, then that alienation, that feeling of being an alien in the world you thought accepted you but actually doesn't, that actually incarcerates you, becomes your gateway to gnosis. And that gateway to gnosis is the first step of the knowledge that will set you free which is kind of exactly how they say it, whether it's CRT or Marxism or queer theory. With And I am working on, I don't know how I want to present it. I feel like I had to do this first, a podcast on queer Gnosticism, which I think is the easiest way to actually see what's going on with this. As the knowledge of falling captive to the world, Gnosis is at the same time the mean, sorry, as the knowledge of falling captive to the world, Gnosis is at the same time the means of escaping it. Thus, Irenaeus recounts the meaning that Gnosis had for the Valentinians. So I didn't mention those people in vain. Quote, this is Irenaeus talking about the Valentinians, who are a Christian Gnostic cult in the first and second centuries. Quote, perfect salvation consists in the cognition as such of the ineffable greatness. For since sin and, aff- and affliction resulted from ignorance, agnoia, the whole system originating in ignorance, is dissolved through knowledge, gnosis. Hence, gnosis is the salvation of the inner man. Gnosis redeems the inner pneumatic man. Remember, that's your spiritual man. He finds his satisfaction in the knowledge of the whole. That's whole with a capital W. And this is true is the true salvation. So that's Irenaeus explaining the Valentinian Gnostic belief. Irenaeus destroyed it, famously, when it came to it. Uh, French Gnostics and the lead up and and period around the French, I forget who it was. I forget which group it was. They dug up Irenaeus' bones and they danced and threw him around in the street, completely desecrated him. Why? Because they're Gnostics and they're going back to their Gnostic roots. Um, Michael Fallon actually talks about that a lot. I wanted to say it's the Jacobins that did it, but it's not. I don't want to accuse the Huguenots of something when it's probably somebody else. It was one of these French groups that turns out to be on that side of things. Fogelein and all, this is the last paragraph that I'll read from him. This will have to suffice by way of clarification, save for one word of caution. Self-salvation through knowledge has its own magic, and this magic is not harmless. The structure of the order of being will not change because one finds it defective and turns away from it. In other words, we might say, uh, reality, this is in the words of Jay Richards from the Heritage Foundation, who I spoke with uh, in the middle of January this year, um, reality will veto your Gnostic project to kind of, he didn't quite say it that way, but he said reality will veto um, gender ideology in the end. But the question is how much destruction it will cause, how far down the path did we go before reality vetoes it? Let me just read that sentence from Fogelin again, though. The structure of the order of being will not change because one finds it defective and runs away from it. The attempt at world destruction will not destroy the world, but it will only increase the disorder in society. The Gnostics' flight from a truly dreadful, confusing, and oppressive state of the world is understandable. But the order of the ancient world was renewed by that movement, and this is why I mentioned that he's Christian, was renewed by that movement which strove through loving action to revive the practice of the, quote, serious play, to use Plato's expression, that is by Christianity. So just uh, his cards on the table, Fogelein is saying Christianity is the answer to Gnosticism. I, in my Arizona lecture, said that you actually have to have what we should call (laughs) reasonable faith, not in the William Lane Craig sense. Um, that reason and faith have to work together to box out Gnosticism. Reason has to ground faith so that it can't get spun off into these special revelations. Uh, It has to guide exegesis. It has to guide uh, understanding of scripture and uh, development of theology. But at the same time, reason itself has to be propped up by faith that reason can work, that the world is in fact ordered, that that order is comprehensible, that we have the capacity to comprehend it. And um, reason has to be reeled in by faith on the other side, because otherwise we start turning into Yuval Noah Harari and believing we can turn ourselves into our own gods, that humans are hackable animals, that we can do whatever we want with the world. No, no, no. 
faith has to reel it in and tell those people to humble themselves. So reason and faith working in dynamic interplay box out the Gnostic parasite is kind of the, the case that I make in my lectures in Arizona, at least the first two, which I, as they are out, encourage you to listen to. The third one actually explains how um, the mechanism works, and it's more hermetic. And so that kind of is a good good way to kind of transfer and back into my conversation that I had with Paul earlier, because um, well, I had left off not knowing exactly how to go with what was next. Fogline becomes a very perfect transition. Um, but what we draw, the last thing I'd said actually to Paul was the Gnostic disposition, the truly Gnostic one, where we take on, you know, the various characteristics of the pieces of it is wholly pessimistic and crucially it is angry. It's angry at the world for existing, just like, um, just like Jordan Peterson said. And that's a disposition. That's a ec- frustrated, narcissistic, entitled, external locus of control, mental poison. You are in a prison when you've adopted the, mo- the Gnostic mindset, but the prison's called the Gnostic mindset. You have imprisoned yourself in misery and entitlement, in pessimism, in anger, in frustration, in envy. That's the poison. Listen to how many of those things sound like deadly sins. But but it turns out that I had kind of mentioned a little bit of hermeticism to Paul, and he said he's fuzzy on the Gnostic hermetic distinction. So now let's back up out of that disposition, because I said hermeticism is Gnostic by definition one, but not by the other three that I gave him. So if we go back to it relies on special revealed knowledge, we can get to what hermeticism is. I'm not going to go into crazy detail about hermeticism. I want to do a short bullet style podcast on that, but it's so complicated. I can't figure out how to do it. I needed 20 minutes to do the roughest, quickest dash of Gnosticism, and I can't even figure out how to do hermeticism because hermeticism has its own development, its own ideas, its own disposition, but it also has these seven principles and it's kind of got a whole magic formula about how it works. The most famous of those is the so-called principle of correspondence, which you've probably heard expressed as as above, so below, which is actually only half of it. The full expression is as above, so below, as below, so above, which is a snake eating its own tail. It's a circle. It's a circular economy. It's your recycling symbol. Um, It's that's all uncomfortable, isn't it? Um, as above, so below is what Marx called the inversion of praxis. The above, the society itself conditions people according to its demiurgic power that's invested in the people who have access to the means of production. So that conditions you. And then as below, so above is praxis for Marx. That's how you do activism to transform the society. It's theory-driven activism with the intention of changing the world. The point is not to understand the world, but to change it. Remember Marx said that very famously? The point is not for stand, it is for nymphed, which is a transformative process on the world, if we put it kind of in Hegelian German. These things come together. They actually make sense. This is These are Gnostic systems, but it's also hermetic system. So it's using the hermetic system of a uh, hermetic principle of correspondence. And Marx understood to use it from the bottom. Hegel thought you use it from the top. And that's why Marx famously said, I took Hegel and stood him on his head, right? Because Hegel thought the idea has the demiurge power and it's going to condition the world. And then the world through its action is going to create the spirit. That's his trinity. And the spirit is then going to inform the idea and a revolution of ideas will eventually come from the contradictions playing out in the realm of the broad spirit, which is kind of like the conditions in society. It's what we mean by society when we think of it kind of abstractly. Um, Anyway, it's the mood of society, something like this. And so the spirit is then going to reform the idea. And the idea, though, is the center of demiurgic power. And Marx said, no, it's not. Actually, it is not. The idea is a reflection in the mind of man of that which is. And so the idea is not upstream. It is downstream from material reality. So he called himself the first scientific study of history, which he called the Wissenschaftlicher Socialismus, the scientific socialism. And so what he understood, what Marx understood is that you have to flip it over. If you want to change the world, you do praxis in the world. You put theory informed activism into changing the world. The point is not to understand the world, but to change it. And then when you change the world, the world will change everybody through the inversion of praxis, the next round, if you will, of social conditioning. So for example, if you convince, if you do the praxis on yourself and transform your body into a trans person, 
and then you force everybody to accept you and give you special treatment, you did the praxis on yourself and then you did the praxis to get people to accept you and that's your activism to transform the world. And when society starts saying we have to be generous and affirming and kind and et cetera and compassionate to trans people and trans rights or human rights and society starts to say that and condition people to believe it, then you have the inversion of praxis and you reify it and trans becomes real. Up until that point, it is rightly regarded as mental illness. This is how it works. Praxis leads to a change. The change leads to a new society. The society leads to a new, uh, to a new inversion of praxis that socially conditions people, and so the dialectic progresses. However, however, that's just the principle of correspondence starting at the bottom: as below, so above; as above, so below. So hermeticism becomes very, very important. Unfortunately. So Hermeticism gets its name from Hermes Tres Magistus. I always say the Latin wrong because I thought it was, I, I give it a, a soft G, Tres Magistus. Uh, the Hermes, Hermes thrice celebrated, who is supposed to be either the human precursor to or a manifestation of the Egyptian god Toth, who is equivalent roughly in Egyptian mythology, although they're not the same systems, to Hermes in Greek mythology. It was the messenger god, or is equivalent to Mercury, which is an important alchemy ingredient in Roman mythology. It's a theory of change, okay? So it's an ancient Egyptian and Babylonian magic religion of transformation. It has these seven principles. I just named one of them, the principle of uh, correspondence. I told you how it works. There's others, the principle of mind, everything is mental, blah, blah, blah. Like I said, the world's not real. It's phenomenal, like a phenomenology of spirit, in Hegel? Yes. It's a phenomenal thing. It's what you perceive. Um, the world's not actually truly real. We're in this kind of illusion of distinctions and mundane separation from God, but we actually have the ability to change that state. In fact, that's our divinely appointed role. Man exists in the hermetic faith to transform the world back into its fully divine, undifferentiated whole that is holy and perfect. But the thing is, is if that's true, if that's really the state of reality, it's already the state of reality. And so what it is, is that we don't understand it. We don't realize it because we live in a world of illusions and those illusions are distinctions like believing that we're not in that world. And so the game is actually not to make it come true. It is to remember it or in Hegel's words, to recollect it. And in his methodology through speculative philosophy, where you use Vernunft, or use reason as a speculum, as a mirror. I know the gynecological thing, ha ha ha. Where you use speculum means mirror in Latin, grow up. Uh, you use theory as a speculum to reflect upon the world so that you can recollect what it was meant to be in its original Neoplatonic form. But Hermeticism, we're not going to go through all of them. Principle of polarity, principle of gender, there's a whole bunch of them, there's seven of them. Um, theory of principle of vibration. It all sounds like hippie new age stuff because guess where all the hippie new age stuff got it? Uh-huh. That's it. That's the secret. I mean like the, the stupid book. Okay. So it's a, it's a theory of change though. The dialectic that I talk about with Marx and Hegel all the time, the dialectic is hermeticism period. Okay. It's Gnostic in the very broad sense because it believes it knows the hidden nature of reality like I was just kind of describing, through a kind of direct revelation or connection to the divine mind that's key to their, the, the, the knowledge it has is key to our salvation, both individual and collective. But it's not capital G Gnostic or Gnostic even in the dispositional sense because it doesn't see being as a prison. It's not pessimistic and miserable and angry about it. In fact, it's sort of happy about the opportunity. It does think that we are true, that the universe is truly mental. That's a principle of mentalism or the principle of mind that the world is not really truly material. And we, and most importantly, as human beings are not as man are not truly material. We are spirits, souls, pneuma, psyche trapped within a material world. But it does not take that this trap is a miserable circumstance or a prison. It sees it actually as an opportunity, which is kind of interesting in a divine command. Or let's just go with, so we can use the kind of Supreme Court First Amendment Establishment Clause language, a duty of conscience. 
because it sees the divine hidden within the mundane. And it sets man as the unique character. What does it mean to be a human being in the hermetic faith? It means you are the unique character made in the image of God with mind so that you have the capacity to find the divine within the mundane, to name the divine within the mundane, and thus to liberate the divine from the mundane, to get the gold out of the lead, to get the life out of death. The kind of reasoning for this is we have to, I'm not going to get into its whole creation myth, but dip into it a little bit, is its kind of fundamental belief is that God doesn't actually know that he's God. Because God is, because God can't know that he's God. The only thing the perfect, absolute, undifferentiated all can't have is knowledge that he's the perfect, undifferentiated all. Why? Because he's perfect and undifferentiated, so he has nothing to compare himself to. So lacking anything to compare himself to, he can't possibly know that he's everything. That which is everything cannot know that it's everything because it has nothing to compare itself to. So man, having been differentiated from God through creation, which in their mythology is sort of an accident, can come to know the difference between mundane and divine because man is a divine spirit. In fact, it's man in the hermetic belief is the third person of the Godhead. Instead of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's actually God, mind, man. Okay? Or all mind, man. The unbegotten, the self-begotten, and the begotten. So we are divine. We are actually just a aware, mind-driven fragment of God, aspect of, of God, and that we live in the divine world, or sorry, the, the mundane world, and therefore we have the capacity to see the differentiation. And in fact, the cosmic accident in Hermeticism is in fact that the creation happened because the undifferentiated all needed some way to differentiate. And so because all, everything's mind, man has the capacity to come to know what is divine, or in other words, to know what is God, and what God is, and when man knows it, because all is mind, God knows it too, as below, so above. So man coming to know the divine aspects of the world makes it so God knows the divine aspects of the world, and so when man obliterates all of the distinctions, which are illusions, and sees through them all, then God sees through all the distinctions and becomes conscious that he is the undifferentiated and perfect all, and man folds back into that all, having completed the cycle and ended the need for a distinction in creation. So man becomes the unique part of God's creation that can complete God by coming to know God because it's the unique part of man of God's creation that's conscious, that has mind, mind being an image of God. Coming to know God is the gnosis. And knowing that you can do this is part of the gnosis in hermeticism. And so this confers by default to God self-knowledge when man obtains it. So when man figures out that he's actually God, God realizes that he's no different from man, and is in fact God. But God, because he's the undifferentiated perfect all, can't do this without man doing it for him. By the way, Christians get really pissed off at this, this when they start thinking about it. It's so blatantly heretical and so blatantly um, megalomaniacal. Um, Fogline actually characterizes this kind of line of thinking as megalomaniacal, self-serving, and all of this too. So, again, the hermetic belief is that all distinction is an illusion, but sees this as an opportunity, unlike the Gnostics, who would rather wail about it and gnash their teeth over it and really, ultimately, attempt to either destroy it or destroy themselves in kind of this weird self-sacrifice to it. Okay? Now, I'll dip into a thing my friend Charlie Kirk has said very, very well, and I'll take it a little bit in a different direction as I have done following him. He has this talk he gave, or maybe he's given it many times, where he talks about the Bible, and he says the Bible is true because the Bible is a book of distinctions. There's God and then there's man. They're distinct. God different from man. Heaven different from earth. Um, water different from land. Male different from female. Good different from evil. And again and again and again, the Bible just draws distinctions, and comprehension and understanding the world are understood in distinctions. I say, going not that I'm since I'm not Christian, I say that 
to the degree that this is correct, which I actually agree with Charlie virtually completely on this, um, it's because reality is a reality of distinctions. Comprehension, period, is the comprehension of distinctions. That which makes things different is that which makes us able to understand them. And if we don't understand that there's a difference between good and evil, we're confused. If we don't understand there's a difference between whether or not we can become as gods and whether or not we're just man, then we are confused. If we don't understand there's a difference between male and female, then we are confused. Clarity requires differentiation. The hermetic belief is that all distinction is an illusion, and it sees it as an opportunity to blend those together. The method of freeing the divine, in other words, that which is the undifferentiated part of nature, of uh, the underlying nature of things, from the illusion of distinction is the dialectic which it's framed in, um, which is essentially kind of in, in hermetic principles. It's the combination, as I was kind of describing, of the principle of correspondence, but more importantly, the principle of polarity. Uh, the principle of polarity is that there, the, the things that appear to be opposite are different, or sorry, are same in kind, but different in degree. And so lifting up to a higher level, level, Alfhaven, sublation, lifting up to a higher level to understand opposites as two parts of the same phenomenon. That's the dialectic, by the way. Doing that is the principle of polarity. Doing it in activity with action with, that, with, with praxis is the principle of correspondence, the actual mechan mechanism of dialectical transformation. This is just straight hermeticism. In fact, I haven't put together this podcast. I've gathered a ton of pieces of it. I need to finish it. I actually think that Karl Marx, when he wrote Economic Philosophic Manuscripts, at the very least plagiarized the Corpus Hermeticum. I think he just took a hermetic text that had a frisson in um, mystical circles, esoteric circles in his day, and rewrote it under his weird Gnostic material demiurge mentality that the bourgeoisie is the demiurge and called it economic and philosophic manuscripts. I actually think he plagiarized it. Uh, strongly convinced of that, having read them both kind of back to back and sort of, I read them both twice back to back. One read the Corpus Hermeticum having already read EPM in the past. Then I read EPM again. Then I read Corpus Hermeticum. Then I read EPM again. And the really weird part is, is when you read um, the Corpus Hermeticum, it's really clear. When you read EPM, it's not really clear. It's very, very strange. Uh, so in Hermeticism, then everything is and always was and always will be at perfect oneness. But we live in this world that doesn't seem that way, which means it's fallen um, for various mythological reasons. Uh, and it's therefore filled with the appearance of distinctions. And this is, I think, their fundamental conceit, their fundamental vanity, their fundamental error. And when we learn to see in Hermeticism, when we learn to see through the distinctions, by so the first gnosis is that this all distinction is an illusion, that there's an under, underlying all, and that there's this process to see through them and transform them into something more whole or holistic. When we learn to see through those distinctions by seeing all the differences as being the same in kind but different in degree, which is the principle of polarity in Hermeticism, which is to say to dialectically sublate them, what we're actually doing is moving closer to the total reunification of everything, which is one of the primary goals of Hermeticism. That's kind of the global goal. The uh, kind of local goal to you is for you to ascend through the levels of spiritual development so that you can go from being trapped in the begotten sphere, realizing that you are the third person of the Godhead, and entering into the self-begotten sphere, which is called the Christ consciousness, or the mind, or mind of God, or Christ, and so you become a Christ or a Buddha or a Bodhisattva or whatever when you attain the Christ consciousness by elevating yourself through the layers of begotten existence, first by realizing that you are, in fact, God. That's I can read from the Corpus Hermeticum on this. It's a little tedious. Maybe I need to. And then you go to the level of the self-begotten. And then when you are at the level of self-begotten, if you achieve that appropriately in the end, whether it's the end of your life or the end of time, you get to fold back into the undifferentiated all and return with a, you know, R-E-T-V-R-N to, um, to God, to, to oneness, to, to, not, to, to being what you are, which is not even a fragment of God, just God manifesting itself in a certain way. So in Gnosticism, the goal is to remember who you actually are and do something with that through renouncing the world in which you are incarcerated or destroying it. And in Hermeticism, it's to realize who you are, the third person of the Godhead, and use that fact 
to start reintegrating everything in yourself and in the world back to its fully divine state so that it goes to the level of being self-begotten. And instantly when you see this, if you're familiar with Hegel and Marx, you see Hegel and Marx all over the place because Gnosis in Marxism is socialism. Uh, Gnosis in, in Hegel is System der Wissenschaft or Vernunft or whatever. Um, it's all very, very clear. Uh, let me see if I can pull up this thing. I want to find it very quickly. This book about the, the Corpus Hermeticum. There's a couple pieces. I wasn't planning to read these. Let me just kind of dash into these. Um, we have a very good definition in the introduction, by the way, a translator's forward about Gnosis. Let me just read that to you. The heart of the Hermetic teaching contained in this book, this is, this is the Corpus Hermeticum, a translation of the Corpus Hermeticum. The title of this book is The Way of Hermes, New Translations of the Corpus Hermeticum and the Definitions of Hermes. Okay. The heart of the Hermetic teaching contained in this book is the realization that the individual is fundamentally no different from the capital S Supreme. This realization is Gnosis. So in Hermeticism, Gnosis is knowing your God. Do you hear that? I didn't make that shit up. Let me make that real clear. The heart of the Hermetic teaching is the realization that the individual is fundamentally no different from the Supreme this realization is gnosis, a single immediate event characterized as a second birth. What is birth and what is rebirth? Just like in, you know, the Maoist prisons, death and rebirth and through uh, Maoist Marxist brainwashing. This or death and rebirth in Paulo Freire's educational method or death and rebirth as a species being in Marxism. This teaching outlines the spiritual path that prepares the way for this gnosis, which is not achieved by any effort of the ordinary mind. So you have to be given that by the divine mind. The words of the teacher work independently of the disciples' thinking. The point of these, this is cult stuff, by the way, that's, that's cult initiation words right there. The point of these treatises is not to argue the truth of their propositions. Truth doesn't matter. See, everything's relative or your truth, my truth other ways of knowing, not true theories or false theories like Kelly Oliver, the feminist, said back in the 89, but strategic theories. Uh, scientific method is concerned with understanding the world, and um, alchemy is concerned with, with operational success. That was George Soros and the alchemy of finance. The point of these treatises is not to argue the truth of their propositions. Their meaning is the change they affect in the hearts of their readers or listeners in awakening them to the truth. That's your description of Gnosis and Hermeticism, according to the translator's foreword of the Corpus Hermeticum in this particular, uh, this particular uh, translation. Now, I want to find the part where it really is like you are God. Right. It does it actually several times in the book. It's not that far in. It's in the first book of the Corpus Hermeticum, which I was not intending to read from in this podcast, is called the Poimandres. Poimandres is allegedly the voice of God speaking to Hermes Trismegistus or Megistus or whatever the third Trismegistus. I'm just going to say it with a soft G, get it wrong, because I can pronounce it that way. Live with it. And uh, so. The Poimandre says the first book of the Corpus Hermeticum, and it's allegedly the voice of God, or the mind of God, called the Poimandres, speaking to Hermes, who is the father, of, allegedly the father of this religion, who might have been a man, might have been the ibis-headed or ibis-headed god Toth in the Egyptian canon, and might have been uh, the god Hermes or Mercury in the uh, Greek or Roman tradition. And so they're having a constitution or a conversation, not a constitution, sorry. I'm going to read uh, about two pages. Um, I don't, I want to figure out where to, to begin. This is in, in part uh, verse. I don't know what to call these. Uh, 21. I'll pick up halfway through that one and read through the end of 26 of the Poimandres. Poimandres then said, the truth is, Light in life is God and Father, whence man is begotten. If therefore you realize yourself as being from life and light, and that you have been made out of them, you will return to life. See, so you are actually God, right? You're made out of God. But Father, tell me further, 
how shall I return to life? My nose, mind. This is um, Hermes replying, but, but tell me further, how shall I return to life? My nose. For God declares, let the man endowed with nose remember himself. See, you have to remember that you're the third person of the Godhead, right? And that's man with nose, man with mind. In other words, a Gnostic, who not through his ordinary mind, but through the divine mind, has seen who he really is. Do all men have nose, I asked? Mark your words, he replied. I, nose itself, remember, Poimandris is the mind of God, is nose. I, nose itself, come to the aid of the devout, the noble, the pure, merciful, and those who live piously, and my presence becomes a help, and straight away they know all things. Seems like a lot. By a life full of love, they win the favor of the Father, and lovingly they give thanks, praising and singing hymns to him in due order. Before giving up the body to its own death, they shut down the senses, having seen their effects. Or rather, I, knows will not allow the activities of the body which assail them to have effect. I, being the gatekeeper, sorry, being the gatekeeper, I shall close the entrances to evil and dishonorable actions, cutting off their thoughts. As for those without nose, the evil, the worthless, the envious, the greedy, the murderers, the ungodly, I'm feeling some iron law of woke projection all over this shit, I am very far from them, having given way to the avenging spirit, who assaults each of them through the senses, throwing throwing fiery darts at them. He also moves them to greater acts of lawlessness, so that each or so that such a man suffers greater retribution, yet does not cease from having limitless appetite for his lust, nor from fighting in the dark without respite. The avenging spirit then puts him to torture and increases the fire upon him to its utmost. That's charming. Hermes comes back. You have taught me these things well, as I wished, O Nose. Now tell me how the way back is found. To this Poimandres replied. First, in the dissolution of the material body, one gives the body itself up to change. The form you had become, sorry, the form you had becomes unseen, and you surrender to the divine power your habitual character, now inactive. The body, the bodily senses return to their own sources. They then become par- parts again and rise for action, while the rest, or sorry, while the seat of the emotions and desire go to mechanical nature. So there's this fundamental dualism between the divine and the and the uh, mundane. And the mundane is bad, but you're going to separate from them. So how do you do it? So this is section 25, verse 25, whatever. Thus a man starts to rise up through the harmony of the cosmos. To the first plane he surrenders the activity of growth and diminution. To the second, the means of evil, trickery now being inactive. To the third, covetous deceit, now inactive, and to the fourth, the eminence pertaining to a ruler, being now without avarice. To the fifth, impious daring and reckless audacity, and to the sixth, evil impulses for wealth, all these being now inactive. And to the seventh plane, the falsehood which waits in ambush. Okay, so you have to rise through the seven planes of spiritual advancement by giving up all of these falsehoods and lusts and and avarice and all these sins. Then, stripped of the activities of the cosmos, he enters the substance of the eighth plane with his own power. That's the self-begotten Christ level. You'll hear this in a second. And he sings praises to the Father with those who are present. Those who are near rejoice at his coming. Being made like to those who are there together, he also hears certain powers which were above the eighth sphere, singing praises to God with sweet voice. Then in due order, they ascend to the Father, and they surrender themselves to the powers, and becoming the powers, they are merged in God. This is the end, the supreme good, for those who have had the higher knowledge, to become God. Was that ambiguous? Let me pause. Is that ambiguous? This is the end, the supreme good for those who have had the higher knowledge to become God. And then he carries on. Poimandres, the voice of God, carries on. Well then, why do you delay? Should you not, having received all, become the guide to those who are worthy so that the human race may be saved by God through you? 
In other words, you become your own Christ. But not your own Christ. You become mankind's Christ. How? By becoming a hermetic wizard in this regard. Okay, so I didn't make any of that up, just to kind of point this out. So, like I said, in Hermeticism, it's to the, the goal is to realize who you are as the third person of the Godhead and to use that fact to reintegrate everything in the world back to its fully divine state. So you elevate yourself to the self-begotten level or in Marxist language that you seize the means of production so that you can produce society and man as they were meant to be. Right? Am I wrong? I'm not wrong. So what you have is this formula as we enter into the to the modern era. We're no longer, when we come to the modern era, into the postmodern era that we're in now, but when we're talking about Rousseau, which, by the way, what, why am I calling Rousseau a Gnostic? Man is born free and everywhere he's in chains. One of his most famous sense, statements, what were the chains? Well, civil society, social expectations, the requirement to use reason to convince people, politeness, manners, all of these kinds of things that designated whether or not you were doing it right. Those were all constraints on how you have to do things. This is a Gnostic disposition. And what was his objective? It was to somehow figure out how to integrate kind of the sensuous, instinctual, um, wild native man with the city-dwelling, urbane uh, character to make savages made to live in cities and to create a higher order human being in that regard. And how are we going to do it through... Um, giving up some of our freedom selectively so that we all have more freedom, dialectically creating what he called a social contract that would integrate society. Exactly the kind of thing that he was complaining about, but now we're going to do it right through his dialectical process because he knows that man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains, which is a Gnostic disposition, which inspired Kant, which inspired Hegel, which very much inspired Marx, which inspired William Blake, and all of these kinds of massive forces track uh, track down through what I'm calling the romantic reaction in the wake. I'm not laying all the blame on Rousseau. There are lots of people to add into this story. Hegel was inspired very strongly by the esotericist Jacob Berma, uh, that you can't ignore that. Um, there's the influence of charlatans and crackpots like Luria. There's just the kind of esoteric syncretism that followed Ficino, Ficino's uh, translation of uh, Corpus Hermeticum running through. There's various sects of uh, Kabbalah, Christian and Jewish, some made up, some more rigorous. There's all kinds of mysticism at play in the Middle Ages. The Swabian Pietist movement that inspired and influenced people like Goethe and uh, Hegel and his his kind of one of his other teachers, um, uh, Friedrich. Oettinger, Oettinger, or something like that. Um, there are lots of other elements. I'm not going to lay all of this on Rousseau. It was a, it was a movement. It was a New Age movement, and lots of people were players. But Rousseau was an extremely influential player with the idea of bringing it into the room world of of society building. So rather than this kind of spiritual religious focus, and this is the this is the sentence this whole podcast exists for me to say, because this is where the Christians that I've been arguing with don't understand. Are using too narrow of a definition. Rather than these kind of weird spiritualist programs and cult religion, a lot of which were ascetic and went and hid in caves or whatever and didn't do anything, what you end up with in the transition to Gnosticism in the modern era is world building. We're going to build society the way that it needs to be so that we liberate man from himself. That becomes the post-enlightenment modern era Gnostic project, and Hegel becomes its first codifier. Marx becomes its first true splinter radical, and that's where we place these people. So my feeling is that with Marx and his derivatives, so this is really left-wing Gnosticism, a left-hand path, if you will, sort of, but not really. This is left-wing Gnosticism versus more Hegelian right-wing constitutional monarchy philosophy of the right crap Gnosticism, blended with Hermeticism, what you have trickling down through the modern and into the postmodern era is that Gnosticism becomes the motivator to action. Hermeticism is the methodology of action. Gnosticism is the motivation. Hermeticism is the methodology. And what I'm saying is that following Rousseau and Kant, Hegel codified this for the first time, along with his other influences, Boma, Uttinger, and all these other guys, Goethe. Schelling, he codified this for the first time, and then Marx made it really, truly actionable. 
Gnosticism is the motivator, Hermeticism is the methodology, and the secret religions of the West have run on this all along. When we have the weirdos and the theosophical movement cobbling off of this, making their own crap up, and it just, because it's all syncretistic, sometimes mixes in and sometimes doesn't. John Fetzer has mixed a lot of it into woke stuff, or not him specifically, his Fetzer Institute going into social-emotional learning, which picked up Paulo Ferreri's explicitly Gnostic formulations of education. He says himself, by the way, in another one of his books that I haven't really done anything with, in fact, I haven't even read it yet, uh, which is called uh, the, you know, they're, they're all called Pedagogy of the Something. Well, it's a Pedagogy of Freedom. He had a book called Pedagogy of Freedom, and he actually says explicitly that his model of teaching and learning is the Gnostic cycle. The Gnostic cycle. But there, the Gnostic cycle? No, 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 Gnostic cycle. It's a hermetic thing. Uh-oh. So this is what we're actually dealing with, right? Um, this is what we're actually dealing with. The other thing we really want to talk about to understand this transition, the transition again, though, let me just repeat. You have Gnosticism and Hermeticism getting mixed together in the syncretic New Age movement of the Middle Ages. It's kind of playing off of both definitions. The kind of more strict definition of Gnosticism, which is that pessimistic, envious, angry disposition, is the motivator to action. And Hermeticism, which is the transformational, optimistic aspect of it, the yang to its yin, if you will, becomes the mechanism of action. And what you have is that rather than it being a spiritual pursuit, it gets placed for Hegel in the idea, for Marx and whoever gets to control the material conditions of society as being the thing that's shaping the world. And it becomes a project of society building in order to transform the world in the direction you want to go. Another phrase for that is social engineering, which is why idiotic social engineering programs like cultural renewal and return or whatever you want to call it or reaction or neo-reaction or Christian nationalism or whatever the hell else are all part and parcel of the same thing. National Socialist Workers Party was another one. These are the same they're part and parcel of exactly the same thing. And they pick up different parts according to what they're trying to do. Okay. But what we're dealing with is that there's one other characteristic of Gnosticism we have to understand, which is the Demiurge. Now, the Demiurge, this isn't a hermetic thing. This is a Gnostic thing. Demiurge means artisan. I think I already said that. Demiurgos is the Greek word for artisan, creator. It's the creator who just so happens to be evil, as we've already talked about for various reasons. But most importantly, the Demiurge, whatever it happens to be, whether it's Yahweh, whether it's Zeus, whether it's the bourgeoisie, is the maker and maintainer of the prison of being into which we are flung and into which we can come to know that we are flung. Let me pull back out um, Foglin on that and read what he said. Let me find the page again. Page 7. Remember what he said. So this was from Clement of Alexandria recorded. Gnosis is, quote, the knowledge of who we were and what we became, of where we were and whither into we have been flung, of where to we are hastening and where from we are redeemed, of what birth is and what rebirth. And like I said, I think he's recording that from, it's something that starts with a T, um, Tacitus or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at the moment. It's just a name. The idea is what matters. So the Demiurge is a creator. So... Um, that's the creator of the prison that we're all trapped in. Like the doctor who assigns your sex at birth and now has trapped you in a social construction of gender associated with the sex he assigned you at birth. You're now, you didn't ask to be born in that body. You're now flung into it. And the social constructions, this becomes so important with Hegel and Marx. It's the social, and, and, and Rousseau, this is why their modern strain in politics is so dangerous and important to understand it's the social constructions around the things that we experience. You didn't ask to be born in a black body. That's why you have to talk about it as bodies, by the way. You didn't ask to be born in a black body that is in a world that's conditioned in a particular way by the realities of structural racism, which gives you a second sight called double consciousness, which is a form of gnosis. Well, they call it standpoint epistemology. See, there's a demiurge called whiteness or actually white people with access to whiteness. Are, are, so whiteness is the thing they create in order to justify their demiurgic status. 
because the demiurge is the powers of creation that build out and maintain the prison of being. And you're imprisoned in a world where being black means something if under CRT, which means that you are structurally uh, treated with racism or you're uh, imprisoned in a body that you didn't choose to be born into. Maybe it's that you are born into the wrong body and that you were non-binary, but they assigned you a male sex at birth or that you're trans. You're actually a woman trapped in a male body that they assigned. And it's the social constructions of maleness that are actually holding you down. So we have to destroy those social constructions of gender. And we actually can transform our body and self beget so that we can escape it. Or maybe it's that you were born as a woman and therefore you are shackled to your fertility and you could become pregnant at any moment. And then you have to rewrite the plans for your life, which you vaguely perceive as being in a particular direction. And you can imagine having written all the plans for your life out on a chalkboard. And now you have to erase them all because you got pregnant because, yeah, you did the thing that leads to getting pregnant. But it doesn't matter if you weren't a woman and hadn't been born that way. You didn't intend to get pregnant. If you hadn't been born as a woman, you wouldn't have to suffer the fact that you got pregnant as a consequence of your actions because you have to suffer the fact of your pregnancy. But we have a medical procedure that lets you out of the prison of being. So all we have to do is have unlimited access to that medical procedure. Do you see the mentality? Do you understand the mentality? Okay. So in classical Gnosticism, this prison builder, the Demiurge is something like Yahweh in Genesis, like I said, but is a complete jerk with a serpent telling the truth and conferring the gnosis. The garden wasn't created for man. It was garden to imprison man, to keep him down by a higher level spiritual being who didn't want any competition and then got really pissed off when the competition started to arise through the eating of the fruit. So he gets even madder, throws you out of the garden, turns the whole world into a miserable suffering prison where you have to work, which Marxists is not a big fan of, to feed yourself, take care of yourself. There's lots of pain. There's lots of suffering. And the wages of sin are death, right? And so the key here to kind of get out of the stuckness of thinking in terms of old spiritual pre-modern Gnosticism that Christians tend to get hung up on is that it's not a spiritual magical demiurge and all of his archons and aeons that create and maintain the prison. It's whoever gets to construct society as the prison guard. In ancient pre-modern society, God was the creator and constructor of society. He was the arbiter of how society was going to go. That's how everybody lived and believed. In modern society, we make our own societies. Whoever constructs society is the prison, not just guard, the builder, the guard, the warden, everything to keep you in. So when Marx is talking, when we get to the modern era of, I mean, Hegel puts this in the idea, but when we're talking about Marx, it's very clear. When Marx is talking about seizing the means of production from the bourgeoisie, you think it's an economic statement he's making, but it's not an economic statement he's making. He's not just saying that the bourgeois class is demiurgic. He's saying much more. He's saying that the path to liberation is to become the demiurge yourself. So you do your praxis to seize the means of production and so now you're the demiurge who's going to, through the inversion of praxis, transform society until eventually you reach where you're supposed to go in his Gnostic vision of how history is meant to unfold, and then it can all be set aside. The means of production for Marx is just a phrasing of demiurgic power. He's just talking about where the demiurge is located. He thought it was in economic and material conditions, mostly because he didn't want to pay his bills and also because he lived in rapidly developing advanced, uh, rapidly developing early industrial society, which was also trending toward monopolist, uh, monopolistic abuses. Um, so he placed the means of production in economics and it was called material determinism. And again, the inversion of praxis is his name for how the demiurge builds out the prison of being. So what he's trying to do is seize the powers of Demir, of the Demiurge so that he can unmake the prison of being bit by bit through criticism. And critical theory just takes that a step further. We're going to criticize every single thing, including the very terms of society, the words that we use and how they make meaning. That's postmodernism. We're going to deconstruct meaning itself. We're going to deconstruct the very logic of society because that's what's conditioning and producing the prison. This is has different names, material determinism under Marx, social conditioning, um, socialization, structural determinism under kind of more woke theories, which kind of use both. Um, but the most important part of this isn't just the fact that we're clearly de dealing with Gnosticism. We're actually dealing with a particularly, if we're 
religious satanic, but evil form of Gnosticism, much more evil than other forms of Gnosticism. It's kind of a splinter off of any all the different kind of schools of Gnosticism. It's a very ev- Marxism is a very evil. You could say if you're Christian and if you're whatever that all Gnosticism is evil and satanic or whatever. Fine. I'm just saying there are degrees. This is way worse. And the reason is because with Marxism and all of its derivatives, which includes woke, the woke aren't, and the Marxists just aren't just after power. You know, we always think, oh, everything comes down to power for them. It's about power. It's about power. It's all power grabs. No, no, no. They're not after power. They're after demiurgic power. That means they're after carceral power. Do you follow me? They want the ability to construct the prison of being so that it contours being, so that it serves them until there's nobody else except people like them, so then it serves everybody. They're not after power. They're after power to incarcerate and and abuse. They want to become the thing they think is the evil thing. They want to seize the means of production because they feel entitled to it, Not just envious, obviously envious of it, but because they feel entitled to it, because they know better. They don't just know that this is happening. They know how it's supposed to go, but they don't. They know how it's not supposed to keep going. And so they must be given power, and they must be given power that they are going to use to abuse and incarcerate. They are after demiurgic, carceral power over not just themselves, not just another person, over everyone and being itself to transform the world into what they believe they alone know it should be. And they're entitled to do so because they know and you don't. I don't know how many times I have to tell you this. This will be the simplest expression of Gnosticism. I say this all the time. It's in my Arizona lectures. I put it on Twitter all the time. The reason they behave the way they do is because they're Gnostics, whether that's the World Economic Forum people, whether it's Fauci, whether it's the CDC, whether it's the woke, whether it's the teachers who won't listen to you and will are abusing your kids, whether it doesn't matter. The reason they do what they do is because they're in a cult where they believe they know and you don't. They know how to raise your kids. You don't. You're a danger to them. They're the experts. They know how to manage the environment. You don't. They're the experts. They know how to have a sustainable and inclusive future. You don't. They're the experts, so they have to be the stakeholders who are going to guide the entire economy. They know how to make sure the economy does good things and not bad things, so they have to run the whole economy through ESG metrics and other manipulations. You don't. They know you don't. Why? Because they're Gnostics. And what they want, in fact, is following Marx's splinter, is what they want is carceral power. They want to be the demiurge that's going to force the world and man and society to become what they believe it should have been. The positive transcendence of private property is human self-estrangement, as you might say if you're Karl Marx, or you will own nothing and be happy, uh, and we're in our sustainable and inclusive future if you are Klaus Schwab in the World Economic Forum. For Marx, it was just that the economic and material conditions were the demiurge, the bourgeoisie becomes a demiurge, the constructor of the prison of society, but critical and cultural Marxism thus leading into woke, expand, and in postmodernism, which is kind of like language Marxism and meaning Marxism in a sense, they expand the concept that it's not just economic material conditions that are the only demiurgic force in town. There's a demiurge behind that demiurge, if you will. So the material conditions are partially determined by cultural hegemony, by this ter- so that's cultural Marxism, by the terms of society itself, that's critical Marxism, and through the discursive construction of language and meaning, and that's postmodernism. It's the same thing. So there's a more powerful demon behind the demon constructing society. Cultural hegemony, behind that, the terms of society, behind that, even the discursive construction of language and meaning. So those are the things that they must target and deconstruct. They must tear apart cultural hegemony to set us free from the prison of cultural hegemony. They must infiltrate the institutions and transform them. They must tear apart institutions like the family, like faith, like religion, like media, like education. They have to turn those things into demiurges that push their idea. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. That's Antonio Gramsci, uh, one of the cultural Marxists. Okay? The very terms of society have to be questioned. That's what Max Horkheimer says. Max Horkheimer says in 1969 in an interview, he created the critical theory because he realized that the very terms of... it was that Material conditions weren't making people miserable. There's no knowledge. There's no gnosis there. There's no suffering. 
right? That's what we talked about earlier. There's not, that's not there. That's what we see in, in Fogline. That's not there. There's no alienation if people love their lives and become one dimensional, loving their consumer driven life. You know, they go to work, they work a job they don't really like, but they're happy enough. It's not terrible. They make the money. They come home, they see the commercial, they buy the Corvette, they wash it on Saturdays. Everybody's happy. White picket fence. Everybody's smiling. Kids are growing up to re reproduce the same thing. And maybe they're going to get a Camaro instead and they're going to have Corvette culture, Cor Camaro culture, whatever it happens to be. Who knows, right? But everybody's happy. No, no, no. The material conditions aren't making people miserable. There's no alienation. There's no estrangement when it, capitalism kind of solves those problems. So what are you going to do? Oh, no. Well, we have to question the very terms of society itself. Horkheimer says we can't under, he developed a critical theory because we can't understand the ideal society or a good society on the terms of the existing society. Marcuse echoes this again and again and again. So what we have to do is rupture from the existing terms of society and see things in a completely new way. No one-dimensional thinking where we like our lives and are happy about it, where we're euphoria, where we have euphoria in our unhappiness, as Marcuse puts it in One Dimensional Man. No, 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 no more of that. We're going to rupture from that and we're going to see certain utopian possibilities that have come to be regarded as historical possibilities, as Marcuse says it instead, meaning utopian socialism, because we're going to break free of the prison of being created by the self-referential and self-perpetuating terms of society. This is the problem of reproduction, which then filters into education. So education trains kids to learn to be productive in the existing society. Thus, they go out and get a good job, right? But that means they get a good job in the existing economy and reproduce it with the same values, with the same kind of behavioral modes, with the same ideas, and it reproduces itself. And they're trapped in a prison of being that's reproduced through education. So what you need is critical pedagogy that breaks them free of that. And that's the relevance of Paulo Freire with his explicitly Gnostic teaching program. Are you seeing it? The very means by which we communicate, the way that we think, we think in terms of contrasting binaries. Now we're in Derrida and postmodernism, or actually post-structuralism. And power is, 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 is regulatory. In fact, it's a, it's a, it's a carceral power. Uh, that flows through language and discourses. Now we're in Foucault. Are you seeing it? It's all the same thing. These are all Gnostic impulses that are being that are pursuing various hermetic paths to resolution. Okay, and so the reason that we are failing to grasp what Marxism, Nazism, uh, critical theory, critical Marxism, in other words critical pedagogy, woke, cultural Marxism, all the reason we're failing to grasp what these things are, neoliberalism, is because they are this kind of modern and postmodern Gnosticism in the broadest sense of the word Gnostic. And we don't understand that what they're doing is trying to create the society that they want to create through kind of hermetic magic following Gnostic impulse. And understanding that there's this big turn is very important to this. Um, as far as like woke goes, we get down to identity Marxism. We get into intersectionality. What is that inter intersectionality? Well, it's seeing that all forms of oppression are, are the same in kind, but different in degree. It's in other words, the principle of polarity doing a dialectical sublation of all oppression. So all forms of oppression are interlinked and really uh, interactive with one another. And we must understand all oppression that way. Right? Right? It's the same thing. It's this idea like you're in a prison, and sooner or later you learn to see that you're in a prison, and the prison is, is your cell, but it's not your cell. The, your cell is just one thing in a bigger prison. If you got out of your cell, you're still in the prison. But the prison isn't just the prison, it's the whole prison yard. It's surrounded by razor wire and towers with guns. But it's not even that. If you got out of that, Foucault tells us everything is a prison. The entire society is a power structure that incarcerates us and keeps us locked in, especially with regard to the roots of queer theory, which he becomes the, the father of this in that regard. Being itself is a prison that pre prevents certain potentialities of being that could be liberated through deconstructive practice, and that's postmodernism. So woke, intersectionality, etc., these are all modern and postmodern Gnostic phenomena. The mechanism is a dialectic. I've said this before. I'm not going to belabor it, but it always follows this pattern from, from ideal to, to material to spirit. How did I figure this out? 
Well, you can look at it, but the, tr the fundamental trinity is always the same. It's the same mind, body, spirit. Mind is ideal. Body is material. Spirit is spirit. Mind, body, spirit. But then you think of it as a process. You use your mind to change, to tr transform your body. Your body gives rise to your sense of your spirit. Your spirit gives rise to a new sense of mind. And then it becomes a dialectical process of tr self-transformation. That's the dialectic of self. And it just extends out from that. So we're going to see right now, woke is very ideal. It's going to transform, as I keep telling you, into sustainability, which is very material. That's going to give way to global citizen consciousness, which is going to be um, uh, the kind of a more spirit cultural Marxism move. But each step away or around, it picks up more stuff. Um, it picks up the pieces of the past that worked, right? And so this is a roadmap to how Marxism is going to develop. I don't know what the specifics or the details will be. I don't know how long it'll take for it to unfold, but I've given you the roadmap to Marxism, Marxist theory till 2050 right now. I've just predicted all of it. It's going to continue with the woke thing, but the woke thing is going to get criticized that it's not sufficiently material and it's not achieving the sustainability goals. Sustainability is not going to work out. And the reason it's not going to work out is because people don't have a sufficient global consciousness or global citizenship consciousness, which ties back to the SDGs, sustainable development goals, uh, and whatever will kind of supplant them and expand them and drag them further along. And so that's your... That's kind of the the progression, and then we're gonna they're gonna hit a wall, and that wall is gonna cause burnout if they continue, and then we're gonna have to figure out a new ideal, um, which kind of is funny because it kind of says that Hegel was right that the if the if this were the model that the revolution occurs between the spirit hitting crisis and requiring a revolution in the idea, but uh, we won't go there. So this is incredibly important to understand that we've transformed they have transformed they had a new age movement in the middle ages and they transformed the ancient esoteric or ancient gnostic religions and um mystery religions into the what were called the esoteric religions which were syncretistic and they put together and kind of pell-mell to build out what they needed to do in order to um create this whole system that we have thought is philosophy and science for over 200 years. But it's not. It's mysticism. It's Gnosticism that's cobbled in the other version of the word Gnostic elements of Hermeticism as this trans transformational project. When I just said with the dialectic, by the way, I've done this before, but just to, for, for shits and giggles, I'll take it all the way back to Rousseau, right? What was Rousseau dealing with? Social contract theory and all of this, like I already said. So what is that? Well, he's dealing in the spirit realm. Spirit realm finally gets codified. It comes down through um, the various critiques. Hegel picks it up and it goes into the ideal. Demiurgic power goes from spirit with the social contract in Rousseau into the ideal, into the idea itself, which stands in the place of the father god for Hegel. Marx takes Hegel's idea, stands on it on its head and makes it material. The cultural Marxists took that and put it back into the spirit of society kind of side uh, space of things, critical Marxists and cultural Marxists. Woke takes it back to idealism and has these kind of very uh, kind of platonic forms of what, what it means to be a certain person, but it's got a lot of that cultural Marxism and material Marxism woven in. It's not just structural determinism, which it borrowed heavily from postmodern and post-structural thought. It's also very material still. It still talks about redlining as a relevant thing for why CRT is necessary. That's a material condition. It's not talking just about uh, structural conditions. But it talks about both, like what is the definition of urgency and is that a white supremacist characteristic? You know, are people expected to, to um, uphold certain cultural values or whatever, or et cetera, et cetera. So then woke brings it back to the ideal. Like I said, sustainability goes. So in the ideal, you know, all forms of oppression are one form of oppression, but they're differentiated and not differentiated at the same time. You just have to understand the parts in terms of the whole. And then sustainability is going to bring it back into the material realm and then it's going to go into the spirit cultural realm into the global citizen consciousness. And um, that's basically, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch more stuff about uh, all of the various pieces of, of hermeticism and Gnosticism. That's another time. But I wanted to make the case, and I think I have made the case in this podcast, that... Um, and I'm just scanning the, the notes I made of the conversation I had earlier. There's nothing else I want to say. That there was a tremendous and important turn. And so there is this, this long standing tradition of Gnosticism and, and Hermeticism that are these kind of ancient mystery religions. And then they made their way to Europe 
and there was a new age boom and it took place with the kind of cultural fancy elites. And you're like, why would them? Well, why did Madonna get into weird Kabbalah stuff and start like doing creepy shit in her bathtub? Because they're rich and they're bored and they want deeper truths and everybody's looking for secrets behind the secrets. And that's the people who have the time and the inclination to think that maybe they can get into some magic. That's why. And I'm not like saying, oh, there's just these bad philosophers. Isaac Newton was Gnostic too. He was an alchemist. Francis Bacon had bought into a bunch of this stuff. The roots of science, of modern science, not modern science as it's actually developed, eventually as it grew up out of the, you know, 16th and 17th centuries, after it grew up, but the earliest dips into science, some of which Newton's mechanics is absolutely correct. Newton's calculus is great, but that's beside the point. He had Bacon's outlines of, 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 of science, of scientific method very early on. They're great, but these guys were informed by this stuff too. Um, It took a lot of maturation. It wasn't, in in my opinion, honestly, it wasn't until we really kind of uh, got to sort of almost get into relativity. Really, yeah, until science was starting to mature. Electricity and magnetism was just way too mysterious having come from a physics background. You know, mechanics is one thing, but electricity and magnetism is just weird and light doesn't make sense and there's all these weird... Scientific methodology hadn't even started to mature, and that's just in physics. The other fields have their own things. There's a famous story, it's not time to tell it, of uh, Lyle in geology, who kind of becomes the father of modern geology, because before that, it wasn't modern geology, because it didn't look at rocks. People had theories about how various rock formations occurred, or various rock types developed. In particular, there was a giant fight about basalt, which is a type of volcanic rock that's very common, extremely common on the seafloor. And there were arguments as to whether it was caused by volcanoes or whether it was caused by the seawater precipitating in the into the bottom of, of the sea, seabed, some kind of mineral coming out of it and causing the rocks. And they were in huge fights and they were solving the fights through cancel culture. And they were showing up to eat like one guy, one, I forget how the story goes, but one of these guys had his wife made a play and it was being performed at the theater. And the Guys from the other side of the argument showed up and heckled and threw tomatoes or something like that. It was was cancel culture and arguing and sniping and whatever. And they finally hold this conference and Lyle calls them forward and says, here's this wild idea. Let's look at rocks. And for 20 years, they went and studied the rocks and finally concluded it was volcanoes, undersea volcanoes that were spreading the rock and answered the question for real without them fighting through like cancel culture bullshit and whatever. But that's beside the point. Science had to mature is the point. What we call science today is not how it was viewed during this kind of new age boom in the Middle Middle Ages. And um, there are places where the kind of religious reaction to science and the Enlightenment were, have, have, have a claim that it was rooted in a lot of mysticism and crack pottery uh, that wasn't grounded in faith and had all kinds of crazy ideas that were dangerous and the scientism that comes out of that is dangerous. Uh, They have a big claim on that and for good reasons, but the reasons are not being clearly articulated because we refuse to recognize that there was a giant, what we would recognize in modern parlance, new age boom in the middle ages that informed a lot of things. And some things matured out of that and other things didn't. Marxism did not mature out of this. It concentrated it and turned it, like I said, fundamentally even more evil than Uh, almost any of the other approaches. Hegelianism has not gone away. It has just not gone away. The idea that we can future cast what the world is going to look like and have it come into being by tweaking circumstances so people will build it around us while we happen to rig the system so we make profit off of it, which I think is um, called neoliberalism, um, through public-private partnerships, for example, which is called the World Economic Forum, has not gone away. The idea that we can create some kind of a perfect constitutional monarchy with a Christian prince that rules over everything, like Christian nationalist reaction is trying to suggest, they're just reproducing Hegel's philosophy of right, which is based on the same program. So this hasn't gone away either. I don't think that those are good paths, by the way. Uh, I don't think that they're good paths. The World Economic Forum one is far worse because it's incorporated as much of the Marxism as it can. It's using the destruction to advance its agendas very vigorously. But these kinds of ways of thinking need to be diagnosed correctly. And we can't diagnose them correctly till we understand that there is a specifically modern and postmodern expression of Gnosticism 
that we have overlooked, that we're ignoring, and that once you start to get your head around it, and I just did two hours explaining how complicated it is, and I apologize, I can't help it. Um, Once you start to get your head around it, it starts clarifying, especially the woke and the Marxist and cultural Marxist and critical Marxist phenomenon, postmodern phenomenon, so clearly, and pardon me for my computer making a sound, uh, it makes things so clear that I strongly encourage us at least to take this seriously. I am stepping out into green space here. I've been sitting on this for months, not knowing how to communicate it, stressed out, nervous about how to communicate it. I still am. I don't know how to organize and present this material. We're stepping out into a gigantic open space. And frankly, I need help. I need you all need to start taking, I think as many of you as can should start taking this seriously and start looking into it. And we have to start putting this hypothesis on the table and considering it and its ramifications. I think that there are some important ramifications. For example, if woke is Gnostic and hermetic religion, cult religion, then what we're dealing with, with the woke movement is a gigantic cult conversion. Our families are being split apart because they're joining cults. And that's what happens when people join cults. Our family members and children are behaving in strange ways because they're pulled into a cult. That means we we can't argue them out of the cult. We can't argue or discuss them out. They have to be deprogrammed. There has to be cult deprogramming from this. The people doing this are doing it because they feel entitled to, because they think that what's happening through the Iron Law of Oak Projection is that society's already demiurgically and gnostically constructed. So the society's already brainwashing everybody and the kids. So they have a right to brainwash them into the so-called real truth, the truth behind the truth, which they believe they alone know and you don't. So the behavior is explained. Um, it can't be taught in schools if it's a religion, in public schools. So this puts a big question mark on what we're going to do about that. This is a First Amendment violation in multiple ways, but in the direct establishment clause way, for certain, if I'm not wrong. But this creates an interesting question about the school choice debate, because private schools can do whatever the hell they want. Public schools can't indoctrinate your kids, but private schools can if they want to. It doesn't matter their religion. They don't even have to be explicit about it. And so dumping a bunch of people into private schools, right, as we're starting to figure this out, might not be the greatest thing in the world Um, if they're going to still be woke, which indications show that many will, if not most, if not all, because the big ones at least are going to be, I don't mean big individual schools, I mean networks of schools and franchises of schools and charter school networks and things like that already exist to give you a picture of what that model looks like, are all going to have to be ESG compliant. They're all going to have to be ESG compliant. The economy of the future, if we don't stop the Gnostics at things like the United Nations, are going to be competent. All education of the future is going to have to serve the competencies that, in, that allow you, through the equivalent of social credit, to participate in the coming society. So any school that's going to be a school that allows you to participate in the coming society, notice how the idea was a problem of reproduction had to be solved. Well, they realize that if they seize the means of production of the new economy, then they can seize the means of educating to get kids a good job in the new economy and not end the problem of reproduction, but divert it into their cult programming. If we don't understand those things, then we don't know exactly what we're doing. But there are massive consequences. If this is cult religion, our military, our federal and state apparatuses, our public schools are all completely out of line by the First Amendment. This is a serious question to be asking because this is a seriously good explanation for what's going on. We aren't going to get to the bottom of that. We're not going to be able to use any of this to solve that problem that way if we don't first do serious groundwork to make the case very clearly that the hypothesis that I'm kind of trying to figure out how to lay out here has legs under it. If it does, it has incredible consequences in terms of how we act, how we react, how we behave, how we think about what we're dealing with, how we talk to people, how we treat people like our family members who get sucked into it, about what we're going to do with public apparatuses that are going into it, about relationships that we make with organizations like the World Economic Forum and the United Nations that are uh, therefore diametrically opposed to the First Amendment, Uh, whether a reaction that's the same in kind but different in degree, 
like neo reaction uh, is a smart move in regard to this whether neoliberal scams, which are part of the program, except that somebody gets to make a lot of money on the process of, of running it, are good approaches to solving this pro- problem. It changes really a lot, and maybe everything. Uh, I'll just kind of close optimistically. I think it's so clarifying, and this isn't what I want to say, but I think it's so clarifying that I think it's going to allow us to get to the bottom of this and not only end it, ideally, but end it kind of not forever for good. This is a story in Genesis. We're not getting away from it forever. Gnosticism is a disposition. We're never going to get away from it. But we can, Marxism has for at least since 1917, we'll go there with the Bolsheviks, has just been this recurring problem, specter, evil thing that just keeps coming up. The Fabians have been running since 1844. Nobody seems to be able to get their head around how to get rid of them. It's because we're treating them as economic and social theories and they just kind of keep coming back. The French Revolution just keeps happening. And the reason is because we're misdiagnosing it. And that can change. But when I told Charlie Kirk about this in a podcast we did where there's mouth hanging open half the time, he said something very encouraging, at least from the Christian perspective, which is that it becomes immediately clear to him as an evangelical Christian why this is not compatible with Christianity. Immediately clear. Like it's not immediately clear according to, say, the Southern Baptist Convention with Resolution 9 that brought CRT and intersectionality into the Southern Baptist Convention explicitly uh, in 2019, it's not immediately clear why we shouldn't use perspectivalism or why we shouldn't use standpoint theology or standpoint epistemology or something, why we shouldn't bring some woke, why we shouldn't consider the question. It's not immediately clear why those things aren't specifically Christian, and you can have these kind of messy theological arguments. But if it's Gnosticism, it's immediately clear it's immediately clear why it's a problem. It's immediately clear why it's not Christian. And that's very clarifying. It's also immediately clear why it's not American. Why it actually, if you want to be a Gnostic in America, you're more than welcome to be. But you have no right whatsoever to impose it upon other people. You can't put it into the schools. You can't, you, people need to recognize it as you going around as a cult missionary. And they need to treat it just like any other cult that somebody might try to get them to join, which you can do if you want in the United States. Um, It's fundamentally un-American to structure our society around a cult. It's just not what we do. And it all becomes very clear. And in that clarity, we start to find pathways to answers. And so I think that's a very optimistic um, reason to take seriously these ideas. Uh, I think the evidence for it is overwhelming. It's so overwhelming, I don't know how to present it. Um, I think you can't throw a rock in woke land and not hit Gnostic something very, very clearly. And I hope that this podcast and the work that I'm doing right now becomes a kind of open door in that direction for us. But like I said, I need help. I need other people looking at it this way. I need other people thinking about it. I need this conversation to develop, not necessarily in the directions I'm pushing it. I might be wrong about details or aspects. I'm not wrong. I'm positive. I'm not wrong about the big picture. I doubted it and doubted it and doubted it and became overwhelmingly convinced. And just like I became overwhelmingly convinced that CRT is race Marxism. But now I can say that Marxism is actually kind of economic Gnosticism. And I can say that CRT is race Gnosticism in a very non-flippant or not glib way, a very, very precise way. Queer theory is so explicitly queer Gnosticism that I think it's actually the easiest way to see how the Gnostic hermetic elements work. So I'm going to do a dedicated podcast to that specific subject when I get figure out how to put it together. Um, so I hope people start thinking about it this way. I appreciate you listening. Uh, the Gnostic turn in modernity and postmodernity, I think, is the the biggest and most important untold story of Western civilization in the past 300 years. And I hope we can start to uh, dig into it and understand it and pick it apart.